Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone from all the different parts of the world. We wait a few minutes as everyone joins us um, as we uh, prepare to uh, talk on the relevantly re regionally relevant case studies that show opportunities and gaps for surveying and climate. This is an International Federation of Surveyors Climate Compass Task Force uh, seminar, and we welcome you to our first regional seminar and annual uh, task force meeting of our four-year four series on surveying and climate. So we're going to have three seminars uh, across the three major glo global time zones to reach all surveyors interested in climate, no matter where around the world. But this one is focused on Europe, Africa, and Western Asia. So we're just going to wait a few more minutes to see, watch people and see, see how many people are coming in, uh, if everybody's in, because we have a lot of registrations, over 240 registrations, so we need to give everybody time to uh, make it in. So I think we should proceed. I'm Clarissa Augustinus, and I co-chair this FIG task force together with Roshni Sharma. And the two of us will be co-chairing and facilitating this seminar today. And we represent both sides of the task force, young surveyors and seasoned surveyors. I am an FIG honorary ambassador and have supported the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. And I now represent FIG on the FAO UNCCD Joint Partnership Initiative on Land Tenure and Land Degradation Neutrality. Roshni works for Frontier SI, an innovative Australian geospatial company, and is on the Geospatial Council of Australia. The purpose of this seminar is to bring together surveyors with an interest in climate from around the world and to map our expertise so we can help to catalyze a better future for people and the planet. Next, let's have a look at some housekeeping. Next slide, Roshni. So uh, we invite you to already start introducing yourselves and your organization in the chat. And please put into the chat links of items you think are interesting or useful for this audience about any aspect of surveying and climate issues. We can also potentially use the information for the planned upcoming FIG publication. Please keep your microphones off until we start the breakaway sessions and questions will be taken from the Q&A or through direct participation by raising a hand in the second half of the seminar. Please start putting questions in the Q&A box right from the start and my co-chair Roshni and, I, and our team of facilitators will review the questions and use them in the three breakout sessions and plenary session. Once we start the breakaway, breakout sessions and interactive plenary, please keep your video and mics on and use the Zoom raise hand feature at the bottom of the screen. If you want to um, speak, you will then enter the queue. We really want you to contribute your voice so, uh, as that's a key purpose of this event. Apologies. The seminar is only in English and all questions, whether written or spoken, need to be in English. The seminar and task force meeting will be four hours long and is recorded. And the seminar part of it will be three and a half hours. The task force meeting will follow the seminar and last half an hour. All meeting participants are welcome to join the task force meeting. After the seminar, the recording will be made available on our FIG Climate Compass Task Force YouTube channel alongside our other events. Courtesy of Dana Heyman, the seminar will be mind mapped and live scribed, and you'll also see this emerge during the plenary session of the seminar. And finally, the presentations and interactive discussions recorded during the seminar will be contributing to an FIG publication. Next. Let's have a look at the content about what, uh, what is the seminar about. It's about surveyor, how surveyors can use spatial technology 
spatial data and technologies, digital transformation and innovation for climate action. Together, we will be defining and assessing what the big global land, carbon and biodiversity issues are that are relevant for surveyors working at national and local levels. This means thinking about what the legal, policy, financial and capacity implications are for rolling out new solutions at the scale necessary. Opportunities will be identified for the development of the future of the surveying profession, including technical opportunities and how surveying education needs to be rethought. So let's have a look at the structure of the seminar. Roshni, if we can have that, thank you. After this introduction and housekeeping, I will open with a rapid overview of the UN climate goals on carbon, biodiversity and land degradation slash restoration and how they are linked to surveyors. We will then hear from three expert practitioners speaking on a diverse range of case studies on climate resilience. Each of them will present for 20 minutes. To make the seminar as interactive as possible, after the three speakers have finished, there will be a three facilitated breakaway sessions, one for each speaker topic. These will be facilitated by our, our organizing team to support the speakers. Participants will be able to ask the speaker direct questions and discuss the topic among themselves for 20 minutes. And we encourage participants to share their ideas and thoughts at this time on their challenges and expertise. Facilitated by Roshni, this will be followed by an interactive plenary session of about one and a half hours. First, each of the three breakaway sessions will report back to the plenary for about five minutes. This will be followed by a short overview of a graphic recording of the seminar to this point. Then Roshni will walk us through a, a Kneffen framework to help stimulate our thinking further on the role of surveyors and climate action. Then this, and the session will be live scribed and mind mapped. And then during the plenary session, questions that have come after the, the Kneffen session, followed by uh, the, the second round of live scribing by D D Dana Hyman. And at the end of the at the end of the uh, the, the uh, seminar, then Roshni will close the seminar as we transition into the task force first annual meeting. The task force meeting is open to all uh, to come to the seminar. Opportunity for general task force members and committee members on the task force to meet, and for the TOR of the task force to be presented, plus a report back on activities. And this will be followed by a Q and A. So we aim to end the seminar part of this meeting in three and a half hours at 12.30 p.m. GMT. And the annual task force meeting will immediately follow for half an hour and end at 1 p.m. GMT. Thank you for that. And uh, now Roshni will share my slides and I will do an immediate presentation. Thank you, Roshni. So now we're going to have a very quick look at what the climate goals mean for land, water, and surveying. Next. <laughs> so there are nine planetary boundaries. And as you can see, there are biodiversity, land use change, and climate change. And all of these impact surveyors. Noting that land use change contributes 13 to 21% of global emissions annually. Next. If we have a look at uh, what, what, what are the big global frameworks that we have to deliver into? So the government and people of the world have set goals which allow us to protect people and the planet regarding carbon, biodiversity, and land use change. And we often hear the word COP or limit global warming to 1.5 degrees C or biodiversity loss, or land degradation neutrality. So what does this all mean for surveyors, and how do we engage? I'm going to take you through a very rapid tour to give us the background to these terms and show you why it's important for surveyors. In 1992, the governments of the world had held a conference in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil uh, called the Earth Summit. At the meeting, the governments decided humanity should address the interconnected challenges facing the planet of climate change, desertification, and biodiversity loss. And all three of these are linked to land, water, and marine surveying. To address these challenges, <coughs> the governments founded three sister Rio conventions, which are supported by UN entities overseen by the governments of the world. 
The government's role is known as the conference of the parties, hence the word COP, and governments are the parties. So these conventions and the name of the UN entity supporting them are the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCC, also known as UN Climate Change, and it deals with carbon related issues and climate change. Examples of this in regard to land are uh, forests, for instance. The Convention on Biological Diversity, also known as UN Bi Di Biodiversity, it deals with protection of biodiversity, such as indigenous plants. And then the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, UNCCD, deals with land degradation, drought and desertification, restoration, and the land tenure aspects linked to this land use. So I will define that just now. Each of the three conventions hold meetings, what we call COPs, every few years. And the number of the COP shows how many COPs have been held by that particular Rio Convention since the original meeting. The most recent well-known one is the Climate Change COP28, which was held in Dubai in 2023. The CBD Convention also holds COPs, and its latest COP15 in 2022 adopted a new set of goals for biodiversity called the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework to which 188 governments committed. Among its goals are conserve and manage 30% of the Earth's terrestrial and marine areas by 2030. And restore 30% of degraded ecosystems by 2030. These are big numbers. The UNCCD Convention also holds COPs, and its latest COP15 was held in 2022, where it agreed to accelerate the restoration of 1 billion hectares of land by 2030. Next. Here you can see a couple of examples of what, what the COPs mean to us and to surveyors. Each COP of each convention produces a range of policies, resolutions, declarations, agreements by partners, many of which impact the surveyors. Often the impact of surveying, uh, it, uh, often the impact on surveying of their discussions is unclear because of the climate technical language being used and the global scale of their analysis. Here are four examples of their discussions which impact surveying. Firstly, COP14 is about the decision of the parties to call for land tenure issues to be addressed and among other things, encourage governments to adopt national land governance legislation to support sustainable land use and land restoration and recognize legitimate land rights, including customary rights. Then let's have a look at the next one, COP and UNFCCC COP28 um, on agriculture, Food and Climate National Action Toolkit. This was signed by 130 countries in 2023, and it was the first time that food and agriculture were given major attention within climate discussions on carbon. The next uh, one is on UNFCC COP26. This declaration, which is known as the Glasgow Declaration on Forests and Land Use, it was endorsed by 145 countries covering 90% of forests. And these countries are committed to working collectively to halt and reverse forest loss and land degradation by 2030, while delivering sustainable development and promoting an inclusive rural transformation. This involves forests and other ecosystems involving conservation, redesigning agriculture, aligning finance, sustainable production and consumption, and recognizing indigenous peoples and local communities. And then finally, in the UN CBD COP 15, decision 15 slash four, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. And as I've already indicated, it, set, it sets aside 30% of the Earth's surface, terrestrial and marine, for conservation by 2030, and 30% of degraded land to be restored by 2030. Noting that 20 to 40% of the world's land already is degraded. 
So we can see the land and water Im governance impacts of this are enormous and surveyors have a vital role in sorting out who gets what, where and what purpose. Next. So what we see now is that the world's governments have committed to support these goals and they do this by producing national environment plans that are part of the UN reporting process and how we are doing in meeting our climate goals. Most governments have three sets of national plans relating to the environment. Each plan is linked to a different United Nations Rio Convention, and the three sets of national reports often do not align with each other. You can find your country's three reports on the web. Uh, there are the links. They are known as NDC, NBSAP, and LDN targets. Sorry, NDC, NBSAP reports, and LDN targets. And I'll explain them very quickly here. Next. So let's look at the climate. Governments supply a nationally determined contribution. I think we need to go back one. Thank you. Na governments supply a nationally determined contribution, report to UNFCC. This is a climate action plan to cut emissions and adapt to climate impacts. Each party or government to the Paris Agreement is required to develop an NDC and update it every five years, noting that the next update is 2025. As of 2022, there were 193 parties to the Paris Agreement with 166 NDC reports. Secondly, biodiversity. Governments supply a national biodiversity strategies and action plans, NBSAP, report to UNCBD. These outline national strategies plans or programs for the conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity and provide strategic direction at national level on the management and protection of biodiversity. There are 196 parties to the convention and 185 NBSAP reports. Land degradation. Governments supply a land degradation neutrality report to UNCCD. And land degradation is a state where the amount and, quali and quality of land resources necessary to support ecosystem functions and services and enhance food security to remain stable or increase, that's where, what uh, land degradation neutrality is. So we have 129 countries and they have committed to setting LDN targets and there are 100 LDN reports. Of interest to this audience, there's a group attached to UNCCD, um, the Group on Earth Observation, and um, it's, it helps with SDG monitoring of the LDN, and all national go governments have been provided by this Earth Observation Group with default data on land cover, land productivity, and soil organic carbon derived from global data sources. Here we have a quick map here of Australia. The purple spots are where land degradation exists in Australia. Next, next. So what does this mean for surveyors? Surveyors are vital to the achievement of all three Rio conventions and the future of the planet and people. In these seminars, we are asking ourselves, what are the key roles that surveyors are already playing regarding measuring, managing, and mitigating the present and future impacts of climate change? What specific knowledge and capacity do surveyors have to help it achieve the global goals of the Rio Conventions? And what capacity development is still needed for surveyors working on the climate crisis? Next, surveyors have a major role in monitoring and measurement, and we can see a few of them here. Next. Thank you, Roshni. Implementing surveying aspects of national climate plans, managing land use change, which is causing carbon and biodiversity loss, strengthening land systems for tenure security and spatial planning and land use controls, improving geospatial data and mapping, such as collection, analysis, management, monitoring, and measurement, strengthening valuation systems and natural accounting, risk management, carbon offsets, compensation, and property markets. And of course, measuring and monitoring sea level rise and coastal zones. And finally, natural disaster and building back better. So against this very broad um, outline, 
Let us now move to the next uh, session, uh, which is about our presenters. <laughs> Let me introduce the three eminent speakers for today. Dr. Iranda Gunathalaka, Senior Lecturer at the Faculty of Geomatics, Sarabagumo, University Sri Lanka. He has a PhD in Tidal Monitoring and is Chair of FIG Commission 4 on Hydrography. He will speak on Sri Lanka's National Environment Plan, NDC, and surveying challenges and opportunities. Ms. Ramvisa Shivize has an engineering master's and is a lecturer at Midland State University in Zimbabwe. She will speak on how to use a range of survey tools to monitor flooding from tropical cyclones and its impact on people and their crops. And Dr. Paul van Asperen is advisor, Digital Systems, Environmental Act, National Water, the Netherlands, with a PhD in land administration. And he will speak on the Netherlands' new Environmental Planning Act and how the digital system has been to de developed to support it. So, Iranda, the floor is yours for 20 minutes. Okay, thank you very much, Clarissa. So, let me share my screen with you all. Yeah, so hope the screen is shared and everyone can see the, my presentation. So hello everyone, yes. thanks for the very brief introduction Clarissa once again. So during my presentation I will be talking about the Sri Lanka's National Environment Plan, rather the National Determined Contributions in DCs related to the Paris Agreement and the contribution that we can make as surveyors in realizing them and some challenges associated with it. So this is the outline of my presentation. I will start with a brief introduction to some details about the Sri Lanka's NDCs. And due to the time constraints, I will not be able to cover all the aspects, but I will provide some key facts and some example cases will be discussed on surveyors role in that context. And finally, a brief summary will be presented. Okay. Well, Sri Lanka is ranked among one of the, the countries that are mostly vulnerable to climate change induced hazard. So being a tropical island nation in the Indian Ocean, Sri Lanka has consistently been placed among the top 30 countries at risk of extreme weather events by the Global Climate Risk Index. So the sectors that contribute significantly to the Sri Lanka's economy is such as like tourism, fisheries and agriculture are climate sensitive. So, throughout Sri Lanka has been a low carbon emitting country with currently the per capita emission is about 1.9 tons per year and, and still the, the policies are always like towards the remaining low carbon intensity. So under the Paris Agreement, the countries are determined themselves what contributions that they can make to achieve the aims of the treaty. These plans are called National Determined Contributions. So Sri Lanka submitted its initial NDCs in 2016. And the Paris Agreement long-term temperature goal is to keep the, the global mean temperature rise to maintain about 2 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial level somewhere back in late 1900 and preferably limit this value to 1.5 degrees as the optimum value or sustainable value to reduce the effect of the climate change. So that is the goal and to achieve that we have to stop, immediately stop, you know, reducing the, the greenhouse gas emission as soon as possible to reach this net zero level by 2050. So actually the Paris Convention does not emphasize or specifies what to do and how to do it, but it's rather the countries that has the freedom to contributing to fulfill the gaps of the current state to the ideal level through various strategies and commitments to the NDCs. So that is really important with this Paris Agreement. So in Sri Lanka, this has been done with the, the leadership is taken by the Climate Change Secretariat under the Ministry of Environment. 
So in this is we are defined under three main uh, spectrums. First one is the mitigating indices which present an increased ambition for the greenhouse gas emission reduction. Targeting in Sri Lanka, they are targeting the six major sectors which is energy, transport, industry, waste and uh, forestry and agriculture. So then comes the adaptation industries which represent long term policy goals for Sri Lanka to in ensure that the country is protected from the adverse impact of the climate change. Then the third sector is loss and damage. The climate related hazards pose significant threat to Sri Lankan economy as well as social development. So according to the projections by 2050, the damage will be about 1.2% of the GDP. So further to that, all the indices must be aligned with the at least one or several UN Sustainable Development Goals. So despite low, the low carbon footprint and highly vulnerable status, Sri Lanka commits, committed to increase its forest cover up to 32% by 2030. The current level is about 29%. In the case of uh, 2015 uh, statistics, so and reduce the greenhouse gas emission by 14.5 percent during this decade on the power, transport, industry, waste, forestry, and agricultural sector combined. So, in order to realize these ambitious targets, Sri Lanka further committed to achieve 70 percent renewable energy in the power sector by the end of 2030 and to achieve carbon neutrality by 2015 in the power generation. Further, Sri Lanka has already launched the following major initiatives such as uh, banning single-use plastics, adopting Colombo Declaration on Sustainable Nitrogen Management, as well as promoting organic fertilizer and farming, and also promoting immobility and circular economy, etc. So here, for your information, I am presenting some example indices and their actions and the targets related to power sector. So this is just for your information and how they are aligned and what are the targets and the deadlines. So Sri Lanka has reached nearly 100% electrification in around 2016 and out of 35% are power is generated from the renewable sources like hydropower, wind, solar and biomasses. But the majority of the power generation is still goes or relies with the coal and the oil based thermal power. So the, in addition to that the demand for the electricity is ex you know, expected to grow annually about 5% and it is expected to implement the, the NDCs with respect to the greenhouse gas emission reduction by 25% as business as usual scenario in the power sector by 2030. And this slide is again another summary of NDCs including, so this one is highlighting the, the key uh, corresponding agencies and the other agencies are associated with it and the key performance indicators. And the targets, timelines are mentioned under each activity. So this is quite helpful in following up or you know keep track on the activities and as well as NDCs, as well as to monitor them effectively. So here on I will be discussing some example NDCs and its relevance to the surveys. So in my title it says the challenges and opportunities. So in generally surveys have no big role to play in the mitigation NDCs compared to the significant contribution has to be played in the adaptation NDCs. So I'm taking the coastal and marine sector adaptation indices for as an example. So in that, there are four main you know indices defined under that. NDC one is to establish accurate sea level rise forecasting system for Sri Lanka. Number two is prepare the updated vulnerability maps for the coastal areas. Then adapt the optimal shoreline management works as well as the fourth one is identify and declare the coastal and marine natural areas that are priority for building resilience for climate change impact. So this is really important. So let me briefly go with the next slide which is explaining about the NDC1 in quite in detail. So here is 
are the sub activities that is associated with the NBC1, which is establishing an accurate sea level rise forecasting system for Sri Lanka. So, under this activity, there should be a database to be established with the historical tidal levels by 2023 and then measure and record the present sea level, mean sea level, and assess and publish sea level rise results by 2025. Along with that, to identify the established ad the additional you know tidal measurement stations to be you know cover the substantially cover the coastline as well as you know adding additional sensors also to be completed uh, should be completed by 2023 finally to estimate the sea level rise projection for sri lanka using global best practices so that should be completed 2025 so in all these activities the surveys role is essential in compiling the historical data collecting the present data and analyzing them for effective decision making so in sri lanka the primary agencies are national hydrographic office survey department or national survey agency in sri lanka sri lanka navy port authorities coast conservation department and of course including the universities are involved with this so the contribution of all these related stakeholders is key in successful implementation of these activities. So here it is mentioned that the challenges associated with the same indices related to sea level rise estimation. So currently there are about seven tidal stations running since 2015 which are the new stations. Unfortunately, we don't have long term running stations like some other countries. And we want to further densify the network by adding another two stations, as well as we want to add backup sensors to each and every station that currently we are running in case of you know, you know failures and all. That. So, so far, what the best data we can collect was from Colombo. Uh, Stillingwell type tide gate that was running continuously since 1980s. So there are about 40 years plus tidal data continuously collected, but still, as you can see in the screen, there are gaps here and there. So, in, on top of that, another challenge that we face in Sri Lanka is our vertical data was established sometimes, you know, somewhere back about 100 years uh, time ago during the colonial period so since then we haven't done any revalidation or assessment so as as we are you know continually you know doing some constructions and expansion works in the coastal areas as well as nowadays we have a lot of activities going on big uh, developments going on colombo port as well as port city in colombo so we need to have an assessment of what is the actual mean sea level up to date so we have done some experiment and in some places uh, in the coastal area and we have found out this the sea level has risen over the years up to 12 to 14 centimeters from its original level in some early 1900 so as an opportunity as a solution for the previous challenges or the lack of data for the sea level rise estimation said that ultimate data can be effectively used as an alternative. So this is now commonly used in most part of the world as well as the scientific community has widely accepted it as a method. So we did the comparison with the ultimate sea surface height and observed type for the same period for 20 years and we did a correlation test and it was very well matched like 0.87 correlation for the 20 years data as you see in the graph. And then a sea level rise trend map was generated for the Sri Lankan waters using the ultimate multi mission satellite ultimate data obtained. And the obtained sea level rise is between 2.5 to 3 millimeters per year, as you can see in the map. And then similarly, we did another study with the observed tide from the Colombo using the 40 years data and that rate was about three millimeters for the same period so more or less they are closely matching and then moving on to the second example of the NDCs about the coastal sector which is preparation of the 
vulnerability maps for the coastal belt of Sri Lanka. So the related activities are to update the inundation maps covering the coastal area according to the sea level rise forecast by 2024. To prepare sea level rise influence risk map for the coastal zone and take appropriate actions to be completed by 2025. And based on those updated existing coastal development setbacks to be revised by 2026. So these are the plans related to the NDC2 in the coastal sector. So here the greatest challenge or the problem that we face in Sri Lanka is unfortunately there is no high resolution digital elevation models or data that we can use to create such high resolution dims especially related to these type of uh, studies. So only 5 to you know, 10 meter contour maps are available with our national mapping agency in 10,000 and 50,000 scale. So this is really inadequate in modeling such micro scale phenomena like sea level rise. Of course, if you use conventional survey techniques, it will take ages to complete. So as an option, we need to go for rapid data collection measure. It can be derived centimeter level accuracy in, you know, in a quick double quick time so that to overcome these challenges the options are we can use UAVs, LIDARs as well as high resolution satellite images. So we have done a pilot study uh, to see the capability of UAV photogrammetric techniques in one of the famous tourism hotspots in southern part of Sri Lanka which is called GOAL and we achieved 3 cm digital elevation model accuracy and as you can see in, in the other photographs you can see clearly the blue line which is the line uh, of the sea level in 2100 years time so anything below that will be inundated So as a summary, since we committed many NDCs covering various sectors, while some are directly associated with special data, there are many serving opportunities and solutions available for the, in the world today. So as a developing country, we are facing several challenges in realizing those effectively. So some of the key points to be noted as follows. So lack of long-term continuous tidal data to determine the actual to sea level rise is challenging. Use of modern serving techniques in generating accurate digital elevation models, especially in required in assessing the climate change impacts and mitigation planning. So problems in retrieving the historical data and from the respective agencies due to the poor achieving method is also a challenge. So, it says data is available but once we see they can't find the data or the, the data is there and the metadata is missing so it's a big problem so we want to combine all the data and have a kind of a time series data so cooperation between agencies is also critical due to various institutional custodians like sharing the data and many other issues are so to be solved in the policy level so in collaboration with the regional and the global centers are also essential, like especially like the sea level data, like PSMSL or altimeter data from ABSO or GLOSS, so on. And establishing a working teams and national committees are also crucial for each NDCs to smooth the running and you know assessing the progress and all that. And lastly, some capacity building programs are needed to support to achieve the NDCs as this has to be done in national level and many agencies are involved with this and one should follow the same standard and same uh, procedures. So all these key points related to serving are essential in real, you know, realization of the NDCs effectively and fight against climate change. So at the end as surveys we have a huge role to play as we provide all the baseline data and critical information for better decision making. So with that, let me remain and I'm also happy to you know be with you in during the breakout room for your further questions. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Yolanda, for a very interesting presentation and for keeping to time. And now we're going to uh, pass the floor over to Rampitsa uh, Shivitsa, uh, who's going to speak about flooding, tropical flooding. Thank you, Rampitsa. Um, greetings, everyone. Can I have the slides, Roshni? Yes, they're on their way. You know, as we wait, you know, we, we, we come to realize how diverse the roles and responsibilities of surveyors are. It's just so much, so many different things that surveyors have to know and do and think through. So uh, thanks. Um, the topic of my presentation is monitoring floods using a range of geospatial tools. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So as an introduction, uh, is the monitoring uh, floods from tropical tropical cyclones. Uh, the insights are mainly from the tropi tropical cyclone. Sorry, there's there's been a a hitch. Sorry, all good. Please continue in bedside. Okay, thank you. So, um, looking at the introduction, it's the monitoring of floods from tropical cyclones. And our insights are coming from tropical cyclone Idai's impact on Shimani Man in Zimbabwe. And uh, the tropical cyclone was of 2019. Next slide. So here I've got the map of uh, Chimani Mani. Um, it's showing also where Chimani Mani is situated in Zimbabwe and also where Zimbabwe is in Africa, as you can see. Um, so Chimani Mani is actually a mountainous area. So most of the people who stay in Chimani Mani actually choose to, to stay closer to the river channel so that they uh, they have access to to water to water to a good water supply. Can you go to the next slide? So as a background, the um, topic of the article was damage and loss assessment due to tropical cyclone in ice flooding in the Man Man district. Uh, tropical cyclones such as uh, cyclone Idai. Uh, originated from the Mozambican Channel in Madagascar. Hence, Mozambique uh, Bay was the most hit, and it proceeded to Zimbabwe and Malawi. In total, it killed uh, over 1,000 people. So in Zimbabwe, Chimani Man that we hit the hardest, and this flood was characterized by extensive flash flooding. There were landslides, and there were very high-speed winds. So this... Um, actually led to a need for an effective mon monitoring tools for flood-related damage and, uh, and assessment. Next slide. So we have in pictures um, the some of the flooding events that occurred in Chimanman. As you can see on the first picture, a, a stripped away by the water. And the next one, the road was destroyed. And we can see a lot of boulders and trees that had fallen even on the third slide. We also have a mountain shown on the on the third picture. Can we have the next slide, please? So um, the tools for monitoring this flood event, uh, the first one is uh, actually satellite remote sensing, where we use the radar images and the optical images. Then um, for I also use quantum GIS, which is an open open source software. So for the radar image, it was a Sentinel one GRD, uh, which is ground ridge detected image. Then for the optical imagery, there was Sentinel two and Landsat eight. So GIS was mainly there for spatial analysis, which is um, the integration of various geospatial layers, enabling analysis of the flood extent, the vulnerable areas, uh, vegetation, and the infrastructure that was at risk. The next one. Uh, now we look at the methodology. So on the um, 
left side, there is a, a Sentinel-1 GRD. It was the processing of the radar imagery. So we had uh, the before and after image mosaic, then the, the pre-processing and other processing processes leading us to a um, flood extent map as you see closer to the bottom. Then on the other side, we had uh, the processing of the optical data, which was to before and after flood images. There was also pre-processing. And then from there, there was um, normalized difference built up index and then normalized difference vegetation index. I'll explain further about this in the next slide. And um, the output from there was the NDBI change map and the NDVI change map. So after that, there was fusion of uh, the factorized flood extent to the NDBI and NDVI change maps, which led us to uh, the process of um, finding out about the, the, assess the damage assessment and also to the validation of, of the results from the damage assessment. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, um, okay. I'm going to talk briefly about um, the NDVI and the NDBI. Um, okay, so NDVI is actually a measure of the access of the, it's, it's used to measure uh, and assess the health and abundance of vegetation in a given area. And then NDBI uh, is used to assess and identify the built up area within a landscape. So that's that's why we, we're talking about uh, checking the change that was there in the vegetation index and in the built up index as well. So just um, to explain further on the processing of the radar, radar data, um, I used a Sentinel SNAP in this case for the Sentinel-1 uh, GRD images. So as I said earlier, there was pre-processing of both, image, uh, both images, the before and after flight mosaic, then there was subsetting, multi-looking, radiometric correction. These are the stages of the processing of the, um, the images. Then uh, the fifth one was terrain correction. And on the terrain correction, um, there was need for a DM, SR, TM, one second. Um, that, that was added to the process and then layer staking. And then the output was the flood extent map, which was later factorized for the second for the sake of fusion with the optical data. Next slide. So then for the optical um, imagery, which is where I use uh, quantum GIS, uh, there was pre-processing. The pre-processing involved atmospheric, geometric, and radiometric correction. Then there was the normalized difference built up and normalized uh, dif uh, difference vegetation index on both images. These were on, done on both the before and after flight mosaic. Then um, there was reclassification. Then the differencing. The differencing. Th this gave gave us the output maps that we have showing the difference between where the, the was before the flood and after flood, how the vegetation looked before and after flood and how the built up uh, came to be after the flood and comparing to how it was before the flood. Then the next step was fusion with the flood extent map. Then fi fi finally damage and loss assessment. Next slide. Okay, um, just a, a recap on the NDVI. The vegetation that was in Chimani Mani was composed of trees and their staple crops such as rice, maize, sorghum, millet, rapoko, uh, bananas, beans, and some green leafy vegetables. And then for the built up index, most uh, built up consisted of houses, schools, deeps, bridges, and tar road. So most houses and uh, beauty, most houses especially, um, as I said earlier, they are built along riverbeds and they are mainly built with poor building materials because these are rural areas where some people um, are actually struggling. So can you go to the next slide? Okay, here we've got um, the flood map, the flood extent map. Um, with the those uh, red areas are showing the areas where the flood, the flood took place. Can we have the next slide? 
Okay, as a comparison of the pre and post flood map, we have um, the first one, the first uh, map uh, with dark gray color representing the river channel that was before flood. And then the after flood, we've got the red color represented the flooded uh, river channel. Next slide. So here we've got the uh, NDVI pre-flood pre, uh, pre period and um, the post-flood period. Can you have the next slide? Then here we've got the NDBI change map. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, looking at the damage and loss uh, assessment, the total area that was affected by flood was uh, 5,882 hectares. This uh, this was sub actually submerged underwater uh, of the total of 345 uh, and 15 hectares area of Chimanmani. So it, it's actually 2% that was affected by the flood. So in terms of vegetation, 93.91%, which uh, covered around 3,716 hectares of vegetation within the flooded area was damaged. Uh, as I was talking about uh, the reason why uh, most of the people uh, stay closer to the river channel where most of the flooding took place. So on the built-up area, about 28% of the built-up area was affected and actually 71.75% was not affected. Next slide. So here, of course, some compre comprehensive insights from this study uh, is that the first one is that remote sensing technologies, they provide a detailed insights into the extent and severity of the flood. Uh, and then radar sensors are very good at mapping flood dy dynamics, including the flood extent, water depth, and evolution of flood over time. Um, this is because the radar sensors can actually access information even during the days when it's too cloudy or even when there is uh, too much vegetation cover. The, rad the radar sensors can actually get the information despite all those those hiccups that may be there. So remote sensing and GIS tools, they provide valuable data for decision makers, uh, supporting informed decision making in emergency response, recovery efforts, and long-term planning. Next slide. So some of the lesson learned in this study was that in disaster monitoring and emergency response, there is need for high resolution images, especially um, that they are necessary for quickly assessing the extent of the damage and also co coordinating relief efforts. There's also an, a, an issue of resolution trade-offs. There's need to balance the trade-offs between the spatial and temporal resolution. And then also validation is important. There's need for ground truth data for, for validation. Uh, this is crucial to ensure the accuracy of remote sensing and GIS based assessments. That's why I had to choose Chimani Mani because it's within Zimbabwe where I where I stay. I actually stay. Next slide. So implications for future monitoring. Um, this study allows for enhanced disaster response, uh, risk reduction strategies, is important for insurance and policy planning, and also for climate change adaptation, and also cross-sector collaborations. Um, next slide, I'm sure it's the end. Oh, okay, sorry, the conclusion. So the utilization of remote sensing and GIS in flood monitoring and uh, damage and loss assessment, it enhances the accuracy and efficiency of uh, these processes, especially uh, the fact that we used both the radar sensor and the optical sensor. It also empowers decision-making, uh, like I said earlier, with valuable information for effective disaster management. So embracing these technologies is a proactive step towards building more resilient, adaptive communities in the face of growing environmental challenges, especially here in Africa. Um, that's the end. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation um, on how to address disaster.
And now uh, we're going to go to Paul. Uh, he's going to give us a presentation for 20 minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you, Clarissa. Maybe the host can switch on my video. Yes. Thank you. Do you see my presentation? Yes, but not in full screen yet. Not yet. Yes. I hope it's okay now. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Clarissa. Uh, and thank you, Task Force, for inviting me. Uh, I would like to present uh, the digital framework supporting the Environmental Planning Act in the Netherlands. And I will discuss the Environmental Planning Act in uh, brief. And I will use a case about building in riverbeds. And the digital framework has two main uh, applications. The first one is the permit check for people who want to build uh, if they uh, need a building permit. And for professionals, they can look at all the digital plans available and they can ask questions like which rules apply at a certain location. Then I will briefly wrap up. And I will use as much as uh, possible the practical uh, 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 pract practical examples in the system. So first of all, the Environmental Planning Act, it has quite a long history. It was approved in Parliament in 2016, uh, but we only started, uh, it was only uh, enforced uh, uh, the 1st of January of this year. So we are live for about uh, seven weeks now. And the main aim of the act is to balance between utilization and protection of the physical living environment. One of the subordinate aims of the act is simplification. So it, we are moving away from 26 acts to, and 60 national decrees and 75 ministerial regulations to one act, four national decrees and one ministerial regulation. However, the simplification is to a certain extent because like one of those four national decrees is a PDF of a thousand pages. So it's still a lot of rules involved. Now the scope of the act is the entire physical living environment. So buildings, infrastructure, water, air, nature, etc. So just the physical world we live in. So the ecosystem of the digital framework, also ab abbreviated as DSO, which I, the term I will use as well, is that we have a system to uh, facilitate citizens uh, and companies within the Netherlands to uh, help them to uh, develop. Uh, so if they want to carry out some activities in the physical environment, they have to, uh, they can use the national services to um, check the rules and to uh, submit their uh, permit applications. And on the local side, we have all the government bodies. And so there are local services for each uh, government body. And we have uh, uh, a few levels of uh, government. On the highest level, we have the ministry. On the mid level, we have the provinces. And on the lower level, we have the municipalities and the water boards. And the water boards are uh, specifically for water management. So the key feature of the DSO is that it is spatial driven. All governing bodies at all levels, they publish their plans and rules. And the requirement is that every rule is related to a geometry. So you cannot publish a rule which is not linked to a geometry. And sometimes the rule is just the area of jurisdiction of the government body. Uh, for example, a municipality, they can make rules for the whole municipality. But a lot of rules, they are uh, related to thematic uh, features. So those fo don't follow the administrative boundaries. And for, for example, nature protection zones, they just uh, don't care about administrative boundaries. So they are just separate geometries, but they are also captured in the system. Now I will now explain briefly a case of building in the riverbed. Uh, as Holland is a, or the Netherlands is a delta, we have uh, many river management challenges related to climate change. For example, we have now higher risk of flooding 
and high risk of extreme drought. And especially uh, regarding flooding, uh, building in the riverbed is controversial because yeah, you can prevent the potential damages due to flooding and it limits water runoff. So building in the riverbed uh, might contribute to flooding. So we want to limit building in the riverbed. So I going into the example from two perspectives. First, first as a citizen, um, if I am a landowner and I want to build a house and the parcel is in the riverbed, so then my question would be, do I need to apply for a building permit? On the other hand, professionals might want to know which rules do apply in the riverbed. And both questions, they will, uh, uh, will be answered using the digital framework. So this is the landing page. It's a one-stop shop. So for everyone dealing with the physical environment can go to this web page and look for certain applications. So I will show you the permit check and the spatial planning part. So as a private person, I have a parcel somewhere here uh, near the main river, and I have switched on the municipality boundaries to show to give you an idea of the lowest level of uh, of the government body. Then I zoom in. Uh, I have drawn my parcel here, so I want to build here. And you see clearly the river. And this is the riverbed. And this road is actually the river dike. So you see a lot of development behind the dike, but there is few development within the riverbed. Then I have to, uh, to state what I want to do. So I have a keyword, and I say house, and then a lot of options pop up and then I can select the relevant activity, which is building a new house. And then uh, clusters of questions will be uh, given and they come from different levels of government. For example, the first row, those are questions from central government. These four rows are coming from the municipality and the last two clusters come from the water board. So I have to go through all these questions. And one uh, example is this one. Uh, this question is, what is the service area of the proposed building? So I know my house will be larger than uh, 30 square meters, so I tick it. And then you see that this question disappears. So these forms are dynamic. Depending on the answers given, uh, questions um, will disappear because they are no longer relevant. And a nice feature is that we also have location-based answers. So for example, this question is, do you want to build within the riverbed? Now, this is the riverbed, the parcel is here for us as geoprofessionals. It's clear, it is within, and also the system knows. So the answer yes is pre-filled. So for us, it's uh, quite straightforward, but for administrative people and uh, legal people, this is quite innovative. And what is also nice about this is that this uh, answer is uh, used in the decision modeling. So it's a combination of GIS and decision modeling. So in the end, I need to answer all the questions. Otherwise, I will not get an outcome of the permit check. So there is a progress indication if I have answered all the questions. And when I've uh, answered all the questions, I can uh, press the check button and then I'll get an, as a result, I get an action list. So it's not a straightforward yes or no, you are, but there are several actions you have to undertake. And I want to focus on the permit application part. So the outcome is that I have to apply for a permit for four legal activities. And the first three are permit application for the municipality. And the last uh, is for the water board. Now, just to have the example of the building in the riverbed, I'm going to show you the rules relating to the uh, activity building close to the surface water body. So I have to apply for a permit to build uh, close to the surface water body. So as a citizen, I can now uh, decide, do I want to really want to build or uh, maybe it's complicated to 
to permit application, I can build somewhere else. But if I want to build on my land, I can continue and apply for the permit, but I won't show you that because I now go to the spatial planning part. So this is the place where all the spatial plans and the rules are uh, accessible. So if I open this application, I get my area of interest. And here I have a list of uh, plans valid in this area. And there is a small uh, 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 row uh, of tabs where I can uh, select the government body. So municipality, province, water board, or central government. Now I've selected central government in this case. And I'm going to look at the environmental activities degree. So this is one of these four uh, degrees uh, which are created by the Environmental Planning Act. Then I get a list. Uh, if I click on that uh, degree, I get a list of activities. And here I see the activity building close to the surface water body. And if I click on that activity, I'll get uh, the rules in detail related to this activity. And secondly, I also have the option uh, to uh, show the geographical extent of this rule on the map. Now, there's no area fill for this uh, feature, but here you see the boundary of the riverbed on the map. And below that are the rules by article. That's just the, the, the legal rules we are used to. And here it also states these rules apply to erecting and demolishing buildings and they relate to this area. So if I go down, there are a lot of uh, rules written in that article, but for our case, it says here, it is not allowed to carry out the follow following activities without a permit. And then if I scroll down, it's a long list. There it says, erecting a building larger than 30 square meters. So if I want to build uh, a building larger than square meters, I have to apply for a permit. And this relates back to the question I showed you in the check, uh, uh, where they ask about the, the size of, of the building. So this is how the system works, that all the rules, they have uh, a corresponding geometry, and we use that uh, in the permit check. And also the, the, the aims of the decree uh, are listed in the, in the document. So here it also says all these rules are to prevent and limit flooding, water nuisance, and water scarcity. So the main um, uh, yeah, legal status as of now, you can build in the riverbed, uh, uh, but you have to apply for a permit. But what else, what is the future? Uh, I have now switched on the municipality tab and I see some yellow marked plans and those are draft plans. So they are not into force yet, but we can see what will uh, what the rules will be in future. So using the same uh, systematics as uh, I did with the decree, I have selected the activity for rules uh, for the riverbed, for building in the riverbed. And now I see also the geographical extent to these rules and I see uh, the areas where these rules apply is not completely covering the whole riverbed. I don't know why that's the choice of the municipality, but part of it is, uh, is delineated. And if I check the rules, there it says, on this land, erecting buildings is not allowed. So in the near future, uh, building in this area is banned. So as a citizen, as a landowner, I cannot build anymore. So if I would be the landowner I want to build, I have to apply quickly for a permit because in the near future, it won't be allowed. So that's in basically how the, the system works. So it provides for an automated integrated approach towards rules and locations for the fiscal environment. And uh, climate related rules will be added through the time using spatial plans from all levels of gov government. So that requires some time, but we are working on that. And lastly, I want to give you quick some statistics uh, from our first experiences. Uh, we have about 15,000 users per day. 
uh, we processed about 14,000 applications. So they will be uh, dispersed to the various government bodies. And we are very happy that uh, we didn't have any major, major in incidents. So our uptime is still uh, 98%, 99%. So we are quite happy about it. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Paul, for a very interesting presentation. I'm sure there are going to be lots of questions. Now, um, unfortunately, we've had a little bit of a technical glitch, so we won't be going into the uh, breakaway sessions. We will keep a, to a plenary session. But what we'll do is uh, we'll spend uh, about 10 minutes with each speaker. So if you've got questions for a particular speaker, please put them in the chat, um, in the, in the Q&A right now. Uh, we have a number of questions. And then uh, after that, that 30 minutes, 10 minutes each speaker, we'll try to allot to. Uh, Simon and Angie and myself will just do a quick summary of the, what we heard from the questions and answers. Then we'll move to the live scribe and the Kinefin and the uh, plenary session. And we, we apologize for our technical glitch. So uh, I would like to, Paul, seeing you've just given your presentation, Maybe we could start with you. Uh, tell me something. You, you know, you, you've given us a very good overview of uh, of how the system works. It, can we dig a little bit deeper and ask the the questions about? I mean, the Netherlands must have had a digital system prior to the changes that you've made. What changes did you have to make to the digital system in order to be able to create what we now see? the digital cadastral system, the digital land registration system, and so on. Yeah, thank you for your question. It's really like um, it, it comes along with this uh, integration of the act. You used to have, uh, now I forgot the number, 24 or maybe now let's say uh, 50 acts. And then every act had its own system. So uh, they were not integrated. So if you needed to apply for a permit, you, you had maybe you had to apply at, at, at uh, 10 systems. So um, we, we all uh, put them together. So that was the, the major thing to uh, put all the things together. And another thing we did was to make use of uh, external services. So if there was a, another government service available, we were using it, for example, for logging in, we used the national uh, digital identity server. So we don't build it ourselves, but we link to the existing ser services. So um, in that way, yeah, we really have an ecosystem of, of services and uh, yeah, they, they are networking together. So that was the basic challenge to, to, um, to link it all together. Okay, thank you very much. And um, uh, given your expertise in geomatics, uh, can you highlight some of the technology advances in the geospatial world that you've observed recently and how these are actually impacting land and water resources management in the Netherlands? So we, we greatly benefit that we have a, a system of uh, authentic registers. We have a register for cadastral uh, maps, we have a register for uh, topography and so on. So we can use these registers to, to fill our system. And uh, yeah, Basically, on the technical point of view, I see a movement from uh, we, we have very much use of OGC web services, but for the yeah, let's say the the common uh, IT developers, they are not so much used into these specific geo ICT uh, uh, yeah, guidelines. So they they prefer the API services. So we we are moving away from OGC to e API services, and and, and OGC is actually also supporting these uh, these API services. So I think that's the, the, the innovation on the tech from the technical point of view. Okay, okay. And I mean, if we had to ask the question the other way around, you know, we have a number of pe people who um, are, are, are listening in here who come from the global south and maybe don't have the uh, but maybe they don't, they're still paper-based. Maybe they, they, they don't have digital, but some of them definitely have digital. So what are the, uh, what are the options? How affordable is this uh, system? How much can it be actually adapted to a global South situation? Um, 
it's a very good question. I, I have to say this system is is uh, very expensive. I think we spent more than two or three hundred million on this system. There are for mm. um, for eight years more than two hundred people working on the system. So it's it's huge. Um, yeah. So for the global south, I think that the presentation from Zimbabwe really shows the the importance of uh, uh, of remote sensing because then you can have a quick overview of uh, the area. And so I think remote sensing is still a major um, possibility for the Global South. And I, I also think um, data sharing might help. If So if people share their data, then yeah, people have uh, more people have access to the same information. Okay, and, and we have a, uh, uh, another question, which is uh, asking if you asking you if you're an optimist about the future in terms of the use of urban development plans and environmental plans to mitigate climate change adaptation and mitigation measures, mainly impacting water. Um, I'm I'm not on the policy side, but what I th I think uh, we are quite slow. So I'm optimistic that the rules will come but i think they come late i think that's the, but that's the challenge we all have i think we we want to have quicker change to uh, to combat uh, these climate change but it's hard it's really hard yeah, yeah we all know that don't we <laughs> yeah um and uh just to dig down a little further about uh, skills and resources are there special skills and resources need, needed to digitally link land and river basin landscape data? Because land data is parcel data and lands and landscapes tend to sort of fit into the more climate understanding. Yeah, I think because we have quite uh, a lot of data sets available and um, yeah, we, we, we are a data rich country, I can say. So I, I don't see so much challenges in that. I only know that, but that was from 10 years back when I was working in another department that at the edge of the boundary between water and land, it was always difficult to um, to combine and integrate the data. And But I don't know how if they made some innovations in, in, in that area. But with UAVs and, and, uh, and sensors, I think it, it, there has been an improvement on that side. But yeah, there are so many uh, data sources available these days. So that the, the yeah that um, the the integration of these sources need to be investigated. Okay. Uh, now we have a question here from Norman Maguaza. Uh, thanking you for your presentation. And uh, how useful is the system in cases where there are servitudes, like sewer servitudes, that may pose a threat to pollute the water bodies? Yeah, so in the, the rules is the rules are saying if you build a sewer, you you have to apply for a permit, and then the government body checks your plans, and then they they refuse or they uh, um, or they can issue the you the permit to develop. So it's just the rules are uh, just spec they specify the sewer and the connections and stuff, and if you comply to that, you will be issued a permit. Okay, so, and yeah, then we have. The... Sorry. Then we have. Oh, yeah, that's question. how it works. Mm -hmm. And we have a final question from you. Can someone put the wrong information in and get away with it? Yes, you can also not uh, apply for the permit. Mm -hmm. However, we have, uh, yeah, we have officers checking in the field, and if you are caught, you uh, you have to uh, demolish your your thing, or you have to pay a fine. So that's also uh, into uh, that's also in in the act. Right. Okay, I think that we have. Hold on. So thank you for that, Paul. Uh, we are now going to move to Ironda. Ironda, uh, you have a number of questions. So. Do you, do you want me to ask those, or are you are you okay to do that? Oh, Simon, please go for it. 
Rhonda, thank you for your presentation. Um, very fascinating, actually. Uh, these nationally determined uh, contributions. Uh, Sri Lanka seems to have a very uh, a, a very um, early uh, and, and comprehensive sort of plan to 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 address them. Um, I've got some questions in the chat for you. Uh, the first one is an anonymous attendee. Unfortunately, we don't have a name. Um, can you just talk a little bit about how to monitor sea level accurately? What the methodology is? Um, the question is a moon cycle, atmospheric pressure, um, affect, uh, affect the level, uh, a moon cycle and atmospheric pressure also affects the level. So what, what uh, you, you did talk a little bit about that, but perhaps you could, you could carry on a little bit more. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks uh, Simon for the question. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's not a big, I mean, a complicated scenario. So as far as you have the data, I mean, it's not like analyzing the tide for the data and all that. But this is for the long term uh, water level variation. So as far as you can have a good uh, data set, long term data. But the important thing is you have to make sure that the data is collected with the same or at least with a kind of a fixed reference framework. So like I know that in some places they have tidal data for many years, but time to time they have changed their, you know, the zero level or the offset. So then it's quite, unless you have the accurate uh, metadata about how you have changed it from or altered from with respect to a certain point or at least from a benchmark nearby. So then you can track what has happened to the tide gauge over the period, whether it is sinking or whether it is uplifting. So those things can be, mm -hmm. you know, First and foremost, before you do anything, you have to investigate that. And the second thing is, you have to be careful with the land subsection or we call the vertical land motion. So that also have to be separately handled. I mean, nowadays we have most countries, they have the continuously operating GNSS network. So you can use uh, long term data from that uh, continuous GNSS networks. Mm -hmm and see whether any vertical land motion is happening. And that will be another correction for the inverse correction for the sea level. Plus there are, you know, of course, as correctly mentioned by the question, the, the person who mentioned, the barometric correction or the atmospheric correction. So that is another concern that we have to add some correction we call inverse barometric correction. So we have to get the, pressure or atmospheric pressure reading, so at least once a day or continuous data over the period and see over the period how these uh, atmospheric changes influences and then you have to add a correction for that as well. So there are equations for that. So yeah, as for, I want to summarize again, mm -hmm. of course you have to look for the, uh, the, the consistency of the tight gauge itself, whether the data has been changed, shifted or the location is being shifted. So that you had validate from uh, you know from the metadata or nearby reference station. Second thing is we have to assess for the vertical land motion and add corrections. Mm -hmm. so that should be done separately using separate observations. And the third one is the inverse barometric correction just to account for the atmospheric changes. So once you have done that, then you have the time series data. You add the corrections and just get the linear trend or whatever trend you statistically you can get it. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the next question is from Melissa and she's saying the data set showed a sea level change of 14 centimeters over roughly 40 years. Did you also measure the rate of change either how much it increased in the first 10 years, the next 10 years, etc. Uh, and it, did you notice any acceleration in the rate of change? Actually, Simon, the, the what I presented is the historical data that that is with respect to the initial mean sea level establishment in Sri Lanka. Right. It happened somewhere in 1886, 1884 to 1889, six mm -hmm. years tidal data. So when the, the survey department or national mapping agency first established the vertical data in Sri Lanka, so it's almost like 120 years back. So uh, after that, there were no validation done with, uh, with respect to our uh, mm -hmm. national vertical data right so so from that 1889 
to 2020 uh, this we have done some in 20 2017 so during that 120 years nobody has touched that so so during the, over the that almost 120 years period so that was the difference that we observe uh-huh. the current sea level and the historical sea level so that is not the Thank 40 you. years that is not the 40 years uh, sea level data yeah that was the initial the very first tidal you know vertical data establishment happened in sri lanka right and the reason recent tidal data analysis from you know seven eight years in colombo and some other places as i said there are three places examples were given in some places they have you know slight variation so we still are exploring that why you know some places are having slightly high value and some places are having slightly low value it may be the local land subsidence so we don't we still want to double check it double confirm it mm-hmm. yeah okay. thank you and regarding the question the acceleration and all that we, we because since we don't have the continuous data so that is the issue yeah so we can't say anything about it uh, yeah just the rough comparison with the history and the present status <laughs> that's it <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, Mika asks, remote sensing was mentioned as part of a possible uh, DEM mapping solution. Have you tried smaller scale satellite SAR data for this purpose, like ICEYE? Uh, could you provide more detailed model for the benchmark or for other, for other observations? Yeah, actually, uh, to be honest, we haven't dry any remote sensing data yet. So because I am part of the you know working the working uh, teams in the NDCs. Uh-huh. So in 2020, we started revising as the Clarissa mentioned every five year cycle. We had to revise it that what we have done and we so that is what is the protocol in the Paris you know agreement. Yeah. yeah. So during that uh, discussion, I, I that is my first exposure with these teams. So we there was a proposal from the you know again from the national agency saying that because we need detailed information about the coastline especially for the you know inundation mapping so only solution was as a rapid solution is the remote sensing data but still the accuracy requirement is quite low i mean compared to the very you know slow sea level rise mm. happening in area so I, I i couldn't say a direct answer that which satellite is good or whether the mentioned satellites are good or bad yes but there, there are some exploration, not maybe for the you know sea level inundation, but maybe for the other um, other uh, climate change hazard in you know, modeling, maybe flood and all that. People are exploring on that, especially our disaster management center. They have planned to purchase some stereo pairs of the you know at least half centimeter resolution mm-hmm. data. So, but uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um- I, I, I have another uh, question, which is more a philosophical uh, question from, unfortunately, an anonymous attendee. Um, but uh, this, this, this person says, other challenges, we need to push the government in the whole world so that the indigenous people shall be involved in climate change and its risk, and if need to learn the methods of climate mitigation because they are being touched by the climate change because they're living in forests or beside seas or by lakes. So in other words, uh, it's it's basically ensuring that that they are also uh, very much involved in the whole uh, climate change uh, mitigation discussion and and action and uh, you know how they can be. Uh, do, do you have any 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 thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a really interesting question actually. Yeah, first my my direct answer is you know as the indigenous people like in you know in Australia and in even in Sri Lanka we have a small community so these communities are very small in number and their their direct contribution to the uh, the greenhouse gas emission or climate change is very small their their footprint urban footprint is very low compared mm-hmm. to us or we can we can we can say kind of a civilized people or whoever. <laughs> So our consumption is high, so we we contribute a great amount to the carbon emission than those people. But unfortunately, those people are the real vulnerable people because we have all the facilities. If the temperature goes up, we can you know put on our air condition or whatever. But for those people, the food, the, the ecosystem change, the water is running out, so they don't know how to handle it. So importantly, what we have to do is as a mitigation or kind of an adaptation. 
techniques the government should come up with the policies and especially they have to you know educate these people mm. so to say that uh, you know for a particular reason the a certain ecosystem is destroying or naturally you know destroying and if these indigenous people still doing you know excessive fishing or particular species then they will be extinct so we have to educate that please uh, i mean widely educate them that stop you know hunting these specific type of animals or don't cut these trees so this is what is going to happen they are in the red list or whatever so especially the educating these people is very you know important yes so we can't you know you know as i said they are not contributing that much but they are the vulnerable people and so we have to stop the other consequences you know doing i mean happening due to their you know behavior so that is really important yeah especially the education that is what we can do and especially you know the indigenous people are quite difficult you know controlled by the rules and regulation yeah so at least we have to educate them especially <laughs> the next generation yes yes that's right that's right and include them in the discussion and include them in the solution yeah yeah, yeah. So they have to be a part of the discussion communities yes yeah. absolutely yeah okay um i sorry i have one more question that's just come in from norman uh iranda thank you for your presentation uh is sri lanka not frequently affected by tropical cyclones uh if so or how has this affected the sea levels over time yeah actually the cyclones we don't have much cyclone but we are just you know the the main cyclone going to the india and the bangladesh side because they have bengal but we get some you know uh, occasional the, you know side effect uh, during the monsoon cycle in november i mean mm -hmm. the, the cyclone cycle mm. but that does not affect to the the sea level rise actually it's a temporal thing so, right. but uh, yeah we had some other occasions in uh, like 30 40 years back in 78 we had a you know very disastrous uh, cyclone or uh, destroyed the east coast of sri lanka and then we had the other effect we called the tsunami which was everyone know what happened to sri lanka and the other countries around here mm -hmm. so, i mean these are not actually the sea level rise i mean the long term sea level rise or climate induced sea level rise so what we as the you know in in the in indices and all that we are looking for the climate induced sea level rise so which is a very slow process especially happening due to the uh, temperature increase the melting of the ice in the, the polar and the mountains which contributes uh, more water into the ocean and the greater contribution comes from the thermal expansion so just imagine 1 degree celsius in the whole world i mean in the ocean so how much water how much percentage will be expand so it's not actually the volume the expansion of due yeah. to the temperature so that is the the biggest uh, you know the, the worry that we are facing as due to what is happening due to the climate change mm. Mm. yeah well thank you very much uh, aranda i think we've we've finished our time uh, for your questions at the moment uh, but thank you yeah, very much for your responses we <laughs> unfortunately we don't have the long session like like because our plan was you know we had to hold the plan and having a kind of a, uh, a kind of a breakout session but unfortunate but we try to see if we can uh, you know respond to the other questions maybe later on yes indeed yes yeah. indeed so i'll i'll hand over to angela now please for questions hi hi everybody good afternoon good morning good evening as simon mentioned yes i am angela and i'll taking a few minutes to ask Rambaza, who was the second speaker and who spoke on um, geospatial, who spoke on monitoring floods using a range of geospatial tools. Thank you again, Rambaza, for your wonderful, wonderful presentation. So I'll then go ahead and ask, like, given that floods can have devastating consequences, could you highlight the specific role of geospatial technologies in your research and how these tools kind of contribute to more effective monitoring of floods caused by the um, tropical cyclones, particularly in regards to low-income people and their yeah, food insecurity. Uh, thank you for the question, Angela. Uh, so um, geospatial technologies, these they play a pivotal role in enhancing effectiveness in monitoring floods. So um, 
concerning the low income populations and their food security, here's uh some of here's how. Uh, for example, the first one, uh, these provide us with early warning systems. Um, since geospatial technologies allow us to to act, to have accurate information information about the flood extent, its severity. Uh, it allows for early detection of flood prone, prone areas and enabling authorities to issue timely warnings to vulnerable communities. So by receiving advance notices, uh, low income populations uh, actually manage to take proactive measures to safeguard themselves and their livelihoods, uh, in, including protecting their crops and their livestock as well. Uh, thus, evacuating to safer areas. Then the second one that I have is um, on vulnerability assessment. Geospatial tools facilitate uh, the identification and mapping of uh, areas prone to flood, including low-lying regions, uh, the flood, and also the flood plains. So overlaying this information with uh, socio socioeconomic data uh, helps us to uh, ass assess the um, vulnerability of low-income communities to flood impacts. So um, at the end of the, the day, it helps the population. Uh, it helps us to 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 actually intervene to enhance uh, the resilience and also uh, some of the ways are uh, constructing flood flood um, flood resistant infrastructures and implementing early warning systems and providing access to emergency relief resources. Then the third one is on uh, impact assessment and response planning. This helps us um, by informing emergency response planning and allowing aid organizations to prioritize resource allocation and deliver uh, food assistance uh, to affected populations more efficiently. And then uh, the last one is, uh, it allows for long-term planning and adaptation. Uh, now that we know the areas that are prone to, to flood, uh, there's need for, uh, for, for um, <clears throat> okay, there is a, uh, it helps the, the makers to identify uh, high risk areas <laughs> and implement, implementing measures to, to reduce vulnerability, like I said earlier, such as uh, land use planning, floodplain zoning, and uh, having climate resilient agricultural practices. So I can actually conclude by saying uh, geospatial technologies uh, support the monitoring of environmental changes, uh, such as deforestation and uh, land degradation, which can exuberate flood risks and uh, impact food production in low e income areas. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for that very amazing detailed answer. Uh, we also have another answer from the chat box from um, Melissa. So she says, how were the results of your image analysis verified? Like e.g. 2% people affected by floods and so on. Like how were you able to you know, verify the you know, your image analysis? Uh, okay, so for verification, that's when I used, um, remember for the first uh, process, I used um, the uh, SRATM, sorry, I used the, um, the radar image to map the flood extent. So as a way to verify if it was actually true, I also used the Landsat 8 to map the flood extent as well. So my 2%, which was, uh, which I actually put in hectares, uh, I measured it by um, measuring the, the area that was under flood, that was inundated by the flood. So that's how I managed to verify by first using the radar image and then using the lens at A to see if the results are actually telling. Okay. okay, amazing. I hope this answers your question, Melissa. And we have another question again, which is, are special skills and resources needed to map damage and loss of large scale flooding? What are the skills and resources needed like that you would recommend for people who would want to you know, flow, um, map out or do sort of analysis regarding flooding and cyclones? Um, okay, thank you for that one. So um, the first of all is uh, remote sensing expertise. Um, I can't say you should be a, 
a guru in remote sensing per se, but uh, just the basic know of remote sensing uh, can actually help someone to to actually do to do the image processing, the classification, and the change detection. There are softwares that we can use for remote sensing, such as NV, ArcGIS, and QGIS. But uh, looking at NV and ArcGIS, uh, they may be a bit costly, but QGIS is an open source software that anyone can use. Uh, QGIS can also be used. Um, okay, for, for another skill, there's also GIS proficiency. That's when you can also use QGIS again, you can use ArcGIS. So there is need for one to have skills essential for spatial analysis, data integration, and mapping flood uh, affected areas. Hello, Rambiza, you with us? Okay, while we're trying to get her back on. I'm sorry for the technical wish. I think she was just trying to explain to us on the... Okay, welcome, welcome back. Welcome back. It's good to have you back from Visa. Thank you. Um, there was an issue of internet connectivity that, that it affected. So let me just continue. The third skill is inform, uh, knowledge uh, on, on hydrology. You may not have uh, so much knowledge about hydrology, but some of these things you come, you actually uh, get to know about them while while you are doing the, um, you are while you are mapping the flood, while you are carrying out the 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 flood modeling uh, methodologies. So uh, there's just need to have some knowledge about uh, flood behavior and it's estimating the potential damage. There's also need to have skills in field surveys. Um, um, just because uh, we, we have surveyors uh, in, the, um, in the seminar, I think the, every, every surveyor can understand this better. But even though you may not have the field survey skills, uh, this process can still be done, but uh, field survey skills is just necessary for ground truthing and uh, validating some of the remote sensing data that, that you may have obtained from the, for example, ESA. So you need to know what's on the ground as well. That's why a uh, field survey is necessary. There's also need to, to have uh, data access and acquisition. Like I said, there are some sites where we got uh, images for free, such as uh, the USGS and at Explorer and the uh, ESA Sentinel Hub that anyone can access and get the images. Uh, there's also a need to have uh, good communication skills. So effective communication skills are important for conveying the results for flood uh, damage mapping to decision makers, policy makers, uh, and affected communities. So that's all I have. Thank you. I love how your answers are very detailed and I hope it's also encouraging people to participate in some of these disasters that might be happening. And you also have a question from Sebastian, but I think what you said on grand shooting kind of already explains the kind of um, grand shooting method you had used when you had to go to site to confirm if what you were seeing on the satellite images was also a reflection of what was on the ground. So I, I hope that has answered um, Sebastian's question. So we have another question from Anonymous Atelier. That is, um, how do you collect knowledge and make accurate trend for non-natural flood? That is, those induced by human activities. Um, can you repeat the question again? Okay, sorry. <laughs> how do you collect mm -hmm. knowledge, as uh, collect data, I assume, and make accurate trend for non-natural flood? that is induced by human activities, that's anthropogenic activities? I think um, the same processes can actually apply. Um, yeah, that's all I can say. For, for example, uh, I was talking about using the images, right? We can actually still get the images uh, and also look at the changes that have happened over time. Because, for example, if it was five years ago and there were there was not there was not any flood in the area, and now people have caused some flooding in the area, we can actually do the comparison using the uh, the images. Also, as I talked about ground truthing truthing earlier, 
we can actually go to the place and check out using field service that the changes that have happened along the river channel or where the flooding is actually occurred. Thank you. So much. So I will then round off with the final and last question. Um, what are the key proactive roles that you think surveyors can play to address flooding and the impact on vulnerable people before the crisis hits? Like, what are the strategic measures that you think surveyors can help, you know, carry out this vulnerable um, flood mapping? Okay. Um. So as a surveyor, you can uh, carry out this uh, risk assessments and mapping. So. Um, uh, just because now uh, we've done the mapping of Chimani Mani, we already know that Chimani Mani is a flood flood prone area. So in case there's a, another cyclone coming or we are anticipating a cyclone coming, we, uh, we can actually do the risk assessment. We can actually map and have uh, the correct information uh, of the flood prone areas the, uh, to assess the vulnerability and also private prioritizing interventions to mitigate uh, the risks. There's also need to have infrastructure planning and design. So in this case, surveyors, they play a crucial role in uh, planning and designing flood resistant infrastructure. Um, it also comes to uh, the issue of relocating people, moving them to areas that uh, that will not be affected by, by flood. Um, Especially uh, if we look at uh, this case study, most people always, uh, actually stay and uh, along the, the river channel where we know definitely flood, if flood comes, the, their buildings may be washed away. So as I said earlier, we need to, to build uh, flood resistant structures that are far away from the, the river channel. So also there's need for community engagement and education. Surveyors can engage with local communities to raise awareness about flood risks and uh, also promote uh, disaster preparedness. Um, there's also policy advocacy. Surveyors can advocate for policies and regulations that promote sustainable land use planning and flood risk management. Uh, especially after this uh, disaster that happened in Zimbabwe, I think the policy advocacy uh, came into play um, and it was accepted by the government officials uh, and those uh, in the top offices because of what uh, the, the disaster that occurred, the people had died and all that. Mm -hmm. So surveyors uh, can advocate for that, especially before flood, so that we minimize the um, the disasters uh, and the damage and loss. So there's also a monitoring and early warning systems. Surveyors can contribute to the development and implementation of early warning systems for floods. That's uh, by installing and maintaining monitoring equipment such as river gorges. Uh, we can have weather stations and um, we can also provide real-time uh, data on hydrological conditions um, and also trigger timely warnings to vulnerable communities that's uh, enabling them to have uh, to take proactive measures to mitigate the flood impacts and then lastly there's need for capacity building and training surveyors can um can facilitate uh, facilitating can facilitate capacity building and training programs that are to enhance the skills and knowledge of local communities, uh, the government officials, the emergency responders in flood risk management and response. Uh, so that's uh, just also by providing training on survey techniques, uh, GIS mapping, um, emergency preparedness, uh, among other things. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. I feel so, you know, enthusiastic hearing all of these things that we surveyors can, you know, not just surveyors, of different collaborative bodies can also work in trying to mitigate this climate and all of this crisis that comes with it. So I know I said one last question, but apparently there's other important questions that just came. So this is the very, very last question for you. That is, um, we have Norman who appreciates your presentation and he's asking, that what was the time interval of analysis of data before the cyclone and after the cyclone? Does it make the analysis complex? Um, the time difference for uh, this research was actually four years. Um, so there was the 2019 image and the other, uh, the 2019 images and the other images were for four years prior. And um, 
for for both these uh images that I used, I used I they were for the same period of time. For example, it was in in March for four years at uh, four years back in March, and then four years uh again after in March when the flooding took place. I just had to to pick uh data from the same season. Um, just because uh here in Zimbabwe it's actually the season when the crops are are almost ripe and um they are about to be harvested. So that's why I had to choose the same the same period of time so that maybe the um, the results make sense or <laughs> they can be accurate because it's the same period of time but uh with a four year difference apart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Mambiza, for your beautiful and wonderful elaborate answers. I will then it was great having you and thank you for your presentation. So I will then now um pass it over again to Simon who will give us like a round of, of his session. Over to you, Simon. Thank you. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, yes, uh, I, I will just give a um, a brief, uh, I guess, a, a summary um, based on uh, Dr. Aranda's um, uh, presentation. Um, uh, effectively, uh, to sum up, um, Sri Lanka, which I didn't realise, but is very vulnerable to. Uh, uh, to climate change, uh, it's in the top 30 countries of vulnerable uh, of countries that are vulnerable to to the change of climate, and they've been very proactive uh, in in um, formulating their nationally determined uh, contributions um, for the Paris Agreement. Um, foremost among them were uh, is the greenhouse gas em gas emission reductions by 14.5%. But the things that are, but but the, the the issues that were most of of most use to, uh, or interest to to surveyors um, who we prim primarily are, um, was um, NDC one, which is to establish an accurate sea level uh, rise forecasting system for for the whole of the country, um, which effectively uh, is 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 involving um, incorporating the existing tide gauges into a national into a national system and and basically uh, as as he discussed taking the the historical data um, comparing it and and integrating it with um, measurements and data that is being collected now and and will be collected in the future so building that is a bit, building that is 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 a um, an example of where surveyors and particularly hydrographic surveyors, uh, but also land surveyors can be uh, can be uh, and will be involved in the future in doing this work in Sri Lanka. Um, the second uh, NDC two was to prepare an updated vulnerability and risk maps for the coastal belt of Sri Lanka, which again is is very much um, uh, a, a surveying spatial science. Uh, um, intensive work, and there is a lot of work to do to collect that information, to put it in, into a co coherent national narrative, and to um, present that, and and to then uh, compile it, and then look at how that changes over time. As as hopefully it won't, but it, but hopefully as sea level potentially is going to rise. Um, uh, and and there are other climatic uh, impacts that 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 affect the the coastal zone. So um, you know this as as Aranda was saying, surveyors will provide the baseline data for much of the um, the inputs into NDC one uh, and NDC two and 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 others as well, of course. Um, but but it's very interesting to see that uh, as I say, a, a country like Sri Lanka, which is uh, quite prone to uh, climate change and climatic events um, is putting a lot of effort and a lot of resource into into areas where surveyors can have a big uh, a big impact. So, thank you very much for that discussion, um, uh, Aranda, and, and and it was very useful. It was very useful for all of us to to understand how your, you know, what what you're doing and and how it's working, and and hopefully we will hear um, over time. Um, 
what what how the, how the the, the uh, NDCs have been um, how progress is going towards meeting them and what what difficulties that arise, um, what needs to be changed, what doesn't need to be changed um, to to get to the to get to the uh, uh, the um, results that that have been promised um, and and to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, which is which is a very very big uh, you know, big milestone for Sri Lanka. So that's that's uh, my summation of it. And and thank you very much for a very interesting uh, talk. Um, for me personally, I found it very very interesting. Um, and I and I hope all the other attendees did as well. So thank you. Uh, is it over to you, Clarissa? Thanks very much, Simon. <clears throat> and yes, to encourage everybody here to try and engage with their country's NDC. Uh, because that's the entry point where we can all make a difference and where we can see now how important surveyors are. They're in the critical path of the delivery of our climate goals. <clears throat> so now um, I'm just going to do a very quick summary of uh, um, Dr. Paul's uh, Van Asperen's, uh, uh presentation. Uh, just really picking up some of the standout points for me. Uh, you know, um, I, I would, from whatever I, from the papers that I've heard, I, I think that what the Netherlands is doing is pointing in the direction for all systems that the, where we have to go, uh, because uh, if we don't somehow integrate our land systems and our land tenure systems and our land administration systems together with the land use planning systems, we're not going to be able to manage uh, to uh, address our climate uh, goals. Um, and, and, and each country will have to do it differently. Uh, so what, what we see in what Paul has presented, yes, it's taken, what, since 2016, if I heard correctly, uh, you know, years and years of work and hundreds of millions of euros uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, we can't, uh, uh, we, you know, that, that's the vision we all, all countries have to aim for is, but how do we do it? And of course, one, one of the things that Paul did say is, okay, it's too expensive to be able to replicate across the world. But we have to rely more on the kind of things that uh, Ramvidza has, has been talking about, uh, free data, free dashboards, satellite imagery, and so on. Uh, and especially for countries that are not data rich, uh, Paul indicates how important it was that uh, the Netherlands is data rich and uh, that it enabled uh, them to bring together uh, what what. Uh, uh, climate scientists focus on is landscapes. Together, what uh, surveyors focus on is land parcels. And as uh, uh, Paul indicated, there were issues around boundaries of these things. And we've seen that problem occur in other countries, by the way. It is a major item to keep, to keep on your list um, if you're trying to integrate uh, your land administration system and your spatial planning system. One of the interesting things that I thought that Paul said was, and it really struck me, is that laws and regulations of this kind all have a geomatics uh, aspect to it. They cannot be implemented without geomatics. But also, as somebody pointed out, can you, you know, uh, can somebody pl play with the system? And the answer is, you know, you have to have inspectors on the ground. And there are many countries that don't have inspectors on the ground. Well, what are the implications for that in, ter in terms of the delivery, the implement actual implementation of these big environmental plans, these big global environmental plans, let alone national plans? And then my final takeaway from Paul was, it's too slow. We have to find a way of speeding things up. And that has enormous implications for these very, very heavy land tenure, land administration, special planning systems that we all have in place. How on earth we are going to do it? 
that that's what we're going to try and figure out as we go forward over the next couple of years as the the more and more of the climate crisis hits us and we have to deliver faster and faster it is going to impact our systems we need to be prepared thank you very much and i'm going to hand over now to angie to pour her summary Hey, thank you so much, Clarissa. So I'm just going to have a, a quick run over, a run through on um, Ms. Rambiza's presentation. So you all saw how she, how she has been able to, you know, carry out flood uh, mapping, monitoring flood mapping in um, Zimbabwe, Shimani Mani. You know, we have been able to learn that disasters do happen in Africa <laughs> and in Zimbabwe. And you know, Zimbabwe just experienced the the heaps, the hardest, and it was categorized by extensive flash flooding, landslides, and very high speed winds. So you can imagine the amount of damage that it would have caused, as we most likely saw in her presentation, and how, how she then used remote sensing like radar and also GIS as a quantum GIS, which is an open source software, to perform different analysis to be able to you know, monitor these flood risks and keep ourselves or keep the system or keep of social make as well informed on when these things would happen. She also then went ahead to talk about how she used various indices like the NDVI, that's Normalized Defense Vegetation Index, and also the Normalized Biotop Index to be able to classify them and see where all of these things are happening and how they impact the buildings and built-up environment. You know, she then showed us the pre-flood and the flooded areas in Shimani Mani. And then she went ahead to really answer detailed questions that were lingering in our heads on how, you know, people can contribute or participate to or participate in this climate crisis and how each and every one of us have various roles to play. But everything starts with, starts with you and your own perception. Now we've seen people We've seen presenters from different aspects of the world come together and tell us how they have been able to pay their own quarter in trying to mitigate these strategies. So we, as the audience, we in general, what roles are we playing in trying to mitigate this? In as much as their policies, that much as their governments, what are we doing to actually mitigate it in our own little way or reduce carbon footprints? So basically, she then went ahead to expand on the salient roles that surveyors can play in mitigating these strategies. So I really love her presentation and it was really encouraging for people to, to get out there and see how we can make the world a better place for everybody. So thank you very much, Rembasa, again. And then I will be passing it over to Dana. Over to you, Dana. Good evening, everyone. Just give me a moment while I bring the live subscribe up. So while she does that, we just want to say thank you very much to the three speakers for an incredibly rich introduction to your subject areas so that we can start thinking about how we sort this out in our countries, what we, what, what we can learn from you for our own countries, for our own agendas as surveyors, what capacity do we need to build? And what knowledge do we already have that we can use and adapt? We can see that. Thank you, Dana. But we can't hear you on mute. There we go. Apologies about that. Can I confirm that you can hear me now? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, as I was uh, just speaking into the void, I was just saying, hello, my name is Dana. I am your graphic reporter. So while you guys have been listening to these very rich presentations, I have been visually note-taking uh, what uh, has been said at a very high level, and I hope I've captured some very interesting points. Um, so uh, Clarissa really introduced us to the FIG Climate Compass Task Force uh, and the seminars, and really um, the purpose is to bring surveyors from around the globe to map the capabilities um, to a sustainable climate and better future.
Uh, Clarissa introduced us to um, some of the uh, COP frameworks, which is short for Conference of Parties slash Governments. And uh, the number that follows is the meeting that they have done there. So Clarissa really introduced us to the history of um, the summits and things like that. Uh, we then moved into Rwanda's uh, uh, presentation up here in the middle on Sri Lanka's National Environmental Plan. And there was some very interesting facts around um, Sri Lanka's approach um, and uh, how uh, Rwanda has a, a collected data to fill in those historical gaps and um, done some corrections to really get a robust data set on the seabeds there. Uh, on our next presentation here, um, Rabanza, uh, sorry, apologies if I pronounced your name a bit weird. Um, uh, Rabanzi uh, shared with us uh, her uh, work around understanding and monitoring floods from cyclones in the Chimani region um, and combining different data such as radar, optical indices um, in a temporal sort of space, so before and after, to get a really um, great understanding of the flood impacts there and how GIS roles and skills and technology can really benefit communities um, who are, will, will be impacted by climate change. In our final presentation from Paul Van Asperen, uh, Paul shared with us uh, the Netherlands experience around trying to uh, building a one-stop shop for citizens and professionals um, around supporting their environmental planning act. So they brought together multiple systems, um, land management, water management, just to name a few, across their levels of government into a digital portal um, that gave a really um, uh, simple user experience for the citizens uh, to, uh, you know, um, begin their um, planning and building approaches, I suppose, in this sort of space. Uh, you guys will, I will then continue to finish this artwork as, as the day moves on, um, and you will be then given a copy to refer to and share. So thank you so much. I hope I've done a good job capturing so far, and I look forward to the rest of the discussions and summits. Back to you, Clarissa. Thank you very much, uh, Dana. And uh, we've we had a very rich session. Now we're going to uh, introduce Roshni, who's been really working hard behind the scenes on uh, all the, te the, te the technical stuff and organizing everything. Uh, she's going to go to present for us the Kinefin framework, just to remind us that Roshni works for a very uh, innovative uh, company in the Austra in Australia and is part of the Australian Council, who has kindly uh, made their Zoom facilities available to us. Roshni, the floor is yours, and then you take over the uh, the, the the chairing of the seminar. Good uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here with you today. I am really really thrilled, and uh, I have to say, listening to the presentations by the speakers, listening to the comments from the facilitators, the level of quality that we have is just incredible. Um, really just excited to be here amongst all of these um, ideas that we have and the forward thinking that we're doing about how we as surveyors can play an active and imperative role in um, combating the climate crisis. So I'd like to share with you um, a presentation now. It's about a leadership model, uh, leading in complexity. So I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. So I would like to begin by providing a little bit of an overview of the Kinefin framework. As I mentioned, um, it's about leading in complexity, and it looks like this. On first sight, it is uh, rather overwhelming, and it looks extremely busy. I'm going to walk you through these four quadrants from the bottom right-hand corner, the simple quadrant, up to the top right-hand corner, the complicated quadrant, across to the top left-hand corner, the complex quadrant, and finally down to the bottom left-hand corner, the chaotic quadrant. Now, each of these 
quadrants represent a way of thinking, a way of behaving in the world, a way of responding to the problems that come up, and the way that we apply our knowledge and the skills that we have to solve problems. You'll notice that across the horizontal center dotted line, we have on the right hand side, known, predictable and fact based. And on the left hand side, we have unknown, unpredictable and pattern based. When we look in the bottom right hand quadrant, the clear quadrant, we can see that this is the domain of best practice. Essentially, this is where the relationship between cause and effect is really obvious and we understand that best practice is easy to achieve, easy to replicate. Think of going out into the field with your theodolite or doing a laser scan. You understand exactly how you will achieve your goal. You also really clearly understand what you will get from doing that activity, how to understand whatever levels of accuracy you may have in your data or not, you can quantify it, and you have a really clear understanding of error levels involved. The data is easy to work with, you know its level of completeness, and you understand what happens next with it. This is what I mean by a clear way forward. If we move to the top right hand corner, the complicated quadrant, we are entering at the domain of where expert knowledge reigns. In this quadrant, we, the best we can hope for is good practice, meaning that best practice is something to aim for. However, it will need to be modified for the particular situation that you're working in. And all of these situations will be different they will not be as easily replicable as the first right hand bottom quadrant, the clear quadrant. An example here is think of getting a rocket into space. We know what to do. We know how to do it. However, it's not the same each time we do it and we will need to adjust and um, be able to pivot our approach. Problems will arise, but they will not be insurmountable. So this is where expert knowledge really comes into play. What I mean by this is that analysis and investigation, which are the application of expert knowledge, allow you to achieve results. We'll move now to the top left hand quadrant, the complex quadrant. Now we are going from a worldview where everything is relatively known, predictable and fact based to a more complex worldview where things tend to be unknown, unpredictable and pattern based more often than not. This is the domain of emergent practice of experiments. Here, we tend to only be able to understand things in retrospect. When we think about examples of this, the climate crisis at all scales fits really well. Generally, we deal with information that we get. We don't always understand exactly what the limitations are. We don't always understand how complete a data set might be or what issues there might be when we think forward in retrospect, looking back at it. If we wish to then dial up the level of complexity, we go to the bottom left hand corner. This is the domain of rapid response. It is where chaos exists. In chaos, such as the recent COVID-19 um, pandemic that I'm sure we will all remember for the rest of our lives, which is a great example of when chaos reigns, there is no relationship between cause and effect even at systems levels. This is the domain of novel practice, and it means that we have to make fast decisions with very flawed data sets, incomplete data sets. Another example of the chaotic, chaotic quadrant is when we are in the middle of responding to a natural disaster that has happened, a flood, a tsunami, 
raging uh, wildfires. So I'm now going to take us to understanding what it is, how we can operate best across each of these quadrants. And often, more often than not, we will need to shift from one quadrant to the other multiple times within the course of our month, our year, such as the nature of working through these, um, these types of problems. In the clear quadrant, there's a really clear end goal and timeline. Tasks are really easy to understand and they tend to be sequential and easy to break down into smaller steps. You can easily use lists to prioritize what needs to happen next. And planning tends to be easy to do at the beginning of the project to help risk management. And tools like Gantt charts show the interrelationships of different types of uh, stages of a project. They may still be complex within the way we undertake the project. However, the domain that we are in is the clear domain. We then move up to the complicated um, domain. In here, when we think about taking a rocket into space, tools and templates mean that we can streamline processes that happen often. We often have knowledge sharing led by experts in the way that we shape our teams. Tasks tend to be interrelated a lot more than they are linear. And this is where we find strategic roadmaps can be useful to help us ensure the quality and timely delivery of our work. Project management does become much more uh, important. And we tend to find that expert leadership, uh, that level of knowledge that they have, tends to be what helps us to manage risk and to maintain strategic direction through a hierarchical system. Now, importantly, when we move across to the complex quadrant, thinking of our natural disasters and climate change, hierarchy tends to be limiting. This is because we are now seeking, instead of applying our knowledge, to actively creating innovation. The goal is constantly changing and evolving and stakeholders who are involved are also constantly changing and evolving. Leadership here becomes more about building the team, leveraging strengths and weaknesses and leading from behind or below to remove obstacles and release bottlenecks, basically to facilitate collaboration. The goal and the pathway are constantly evolving, requiring flexibility and agility, meaning that agile project management methods, um, as opposed to the more traditional waterfall project management methods, become much more effective. Lastly, when we are in the in the um, when we're facing chaos, for example, with a pandemic or in the midst of dealing with a natural disaster, all of the old rules go out the window. The goal is no longer relevant. You are simply now playing an infinite game, i.e. to survive, rather than a finite game to win. Um, if you'd like to read more about infinite games, there is a great um, book by Simon Sinek. Um, within the chaotic quadrant, again, leadership is about just keeping abreast of all of the latest developments, understanding how the situation is changing and making informed decisions on the fly. And you really need to rely on strategy as opposed to planning to help um, lean into instinct and experience instead so that you can make the best decisions. Now, I know that this has been very a lot of things to cover, and it's probably not the sort of thing that you are used to um, thinking about in your day to day work. So now I want to bring it back to what does this mean? for surveyors working on climate. Things we know about climate, the, uh, the uh, earth systems and climate science are moving and growing at an exponential rate in multiple directions, both in terms of theory and practice. There's probably almost no way that we as surveyors can be expected to keep up with all of this actively. Number two, the frequency and variability of climatic events um, is rapidly increasing over time and reaching more places more often. 
we're seeing more events happen more quickly, they tend to be worse, and they are reaching all of these different places, these geographies. Thirdly, we're moving to problem solving that is pattern based rather than fact based as the historical record becomes less relevant to the future state, requiring emergent practice and novel practice. So what this means, apologies for the typo, we as surveyors tend to be familiar with detail, certainty and quantification, but to work effectively in the future, we must get more comfortable with zooming out to a systems level and dealing with uncertainty and emergence in our work. We must take a systems thinking approach to creating solutions and to do that, Embracing technological solutions will help us deal with the scales of data that are required to combat the increasing scales of the problems that we're trying to solve. However, I really don't think that we need to feel the pressure to create all the solutions ourselves. As much as an industry, we are both generalists and specialists, it's important now to be able to lean on other disciplines and support other disciplines with our knowledge, because when it comes down to it, we are stronger together. Thank you, and I'll pass you back to Clarissa now. Thank you, Roshni, for that presentation. And uh, now we're going to go to... Thank you for that presentation, Roshni. And now we're going to go to our plenary session uh, and I'm going to hand it back to Roshni to really organize us, get the questions going. Please, people, just put your questions in the chat. Oh, sorry, put your questions in the Q&A, uh, and uh, Roshni will take us forward from here until the end of the seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clarissa. So um, this, I think, is one of the most exciting parts of the seminar. Uh, this is the time when we open the floor up to you, our entire audience, because we know that you hold so much knowledge and so much insight. You work on the ground, you do various projects, you are really active when it comes to thinking about what are the challenges that we face, what are the different scales that these challenges and problems occur at, and really, what is the role of surveyors in combating the climate um, crisis? So I'd like to uh, open the floor up now. And if anyone has a question, please type it into the Q&A or raise your hand. I can see that we have our first raised hand from Edmund Clark. Um, Edmund, if you'd like to um, I'm just going to, there we go. If you'd like to um, speak, please tell us your question. Um, we're not able to hear you at the moment, Edmund, sorry. We can hear you, but very, very faintly. Um, you might need to check your microphone or change it, perhaps. Uh, so, so uh, good morning, everyone. And, uh, Sorry, we can't for... make out what you're saying, Edmund. Uh, there is the established work. Uh, from, uh, it's a little bit clearer now, if you wouldn't mind giving your question. So my question is about uh, how to apply this uh, uh, project uh, in my country, uh, uh, like uh, my Madagascar. Because I'm from Madagascar and uh, uh, we work about uh, first, uh, Sorry, Edmund, uh, it's still difficult to yeah. make what you're saying. Right. Um, so, it's 
Would you mind repeating your question, please? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Perhaps, Edmund, if you wouldn't mind placing your question in the chat. Um, I, we're very um, curious to hear what your question was. Um, in the meantime, uh, we have a question from Sobiyon Umarov, um, who has asked, do we have early warning systems to identify um, sand dust storms? I'd like to ask any of our presenters or any of the members of the audience, does anybody um, have any insights on early warning systems to identify sand dust storms? What we might do then is I what if if anybody does have any ideas on early warning systems to identify sand dust storms, we can certainly come back to that question. Um, I'd like to welcome anyone who does have any other questions or insights to please either put your hand up or put your question into the Q and A box. Um, I'd like to ask open up the floor to our presenters. Um, what do you think are the key roles that surveyors are already playing regarding measuring, managing, monitoring and mitigating the present and future impacts of climate change? Perhaps let's start with you, Aranda. Yeah, actually, thank you for that question. It's really uh, giving a very broad overview that uh, but we do as surveys uh, and generally surveys are confined to boundaries and some other you know kind of a the scope is you know narrow scope but quite recently the, the survey scope has broadened especially when it come to the when we involve with the environmental issues especially with the climate change as well as the natural prone disasters or even the human induced disasters so over the years, the surveys now, uh, you know, use their knowledge on, on spatial science, especially the tools like remote sensing, GIS, especially combining all those knowledge in and giving uh, valuable, you know, insight and decision making uh, information to the other professionals. So that is one of the key, uh, the, the, the pace shift of the surveys to the modern era. So not only even in the climate but in various other aspects also so yeah it's we are playing you know a key role in many you know as i said in my presentation as well so the baseline information is very critical in making accurate decisions and also in assessing the current state and predicting it so all these stages the real the actual status the current status is very important. So it's mostly it, it goes with the location and goes with the you know information, current state of the history and some sort of a computation and retrieval and usually it may come as a form of map or chart or whatever. So yeah, it's really critical and we are as service we are doing a very supportive uh, work for the other expert in the other expertise areas and helping is really you know good that as you know surveys special scientists that we could help with our knowledge with our tools with our capacity to solve these kind of a, a, a national as well as global scale issues as most of the today's world problems are not cannot be solved by one party or one particular expert so we have to get together and work as a team so it's really wonderful to see how the things are coming in uh, in the current state so and so another important thing that what we see today as what we're trying to do with the climate compass task is also try to integrate people and bringing in various disciplined peoples and come up with 
new solutions for that. So, yeah, that's my you know quick uh, reply to your question. Thank you, Miranda. Um, I'd like to ask as well, um, Paul, in terms of the role of digital technology, what do you think is going to be most important for us as surveyors as we journey towards net zero, towards um, more effective sorry, more effective ways of dealing with climate um, climate disasters that occur? Yeah, if you are talking about uh, climate disaster, uh, uh, what I I've got from your presentation from the systems, I think we 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 um, traditionally we were more into this uh, in the right column of the more uh, the less complex uh, things, and now we are going to a domain which is chaotic and uh, complex. Um, so I think and like uh, we we need to. to get the data more quickly. We need to process it more quickly. So we uh, really need to speed up things. So we have to think about how to deliver in time. So that will be uh, one of the challenges. Yeah, I, I cannot think of something else now. That's all right. I see also a hand, maybe um, Simon can add to that. Simon. Sorry, Paul. Um, yes, thank you for your presentation. I just uh, had a question, really, about um, about building in the floodplains that that you were talking about, um, and uh, just just from the New Zealand experience, um, that's that's a very difficult, uh, that's a very tricky subject here as well, and uh, and and as as we become affected more by flooding and more by uh, storm events, then it becomes more of an issue. What are the, at, at present and until it's outlawed, what 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 can a person do in Holland or in the Netherlands to uh, to build? I mean, have you got to have uh, foundation levels that are higher? Um, how, how You have to have pumped sewer? I mean, what how does it work? Because, you know, if you're in a floodplain, your gravity, you haven't got gravity to work with. No, you're right. But the, the, the tendency is that we, we, we are going to ban uh, building in floodplains soon. Right. But we had this flood for a long time. So it, that's what I'm saying. That sometimes it, yeah, policy is. But, uh, but, but are, are, are there big. floor level, are, are there certain floor levels that you have to build to to, to avoid being flooded? Uh, no, we, we, then we put a dike around it. Oh, okay. Already, so. okay, okay. But now the problem becomes we have to build higher dikes. Right, and right, also right. A lim okay. limitation. There's also a limitation to that. So the, the sea level rise is also a big uh, uh, challenge for us. And so l let's say half of our country is below sea level. Yeah. So the question arises, how much are you going to invest in the in the lower parts? And econo econom economically, these lower parts are most important. So all the economic activity is in the flood prone areas. <laughs> so who, when are you going to say we have to move away to the higher land? That's a very <laughs> yeah. difficult question. Yeah, yeah. No, thank, thank you. Yeah, no, it's, it's difficult. To, no, I, maybe in, I'm in all sorry, I, may, I, I raise more questions than solutions. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, that's a really great point, Simon, that you raised there in terms of the, the historic way that we used to do things in the Netherlands has shifted. And now we need to think of new ways that we can both respond to um, climatic events as they happen, but also how we can prevent um, the worst effects on society. Thinking back to um, Rumbitsai, to your presentation, I was really impressed with the way that you use data analytics. Um, what are your thoughts on data sources and the huge amounts of Earth observation data that we are becoming 
able to access. Do you have any um, tips or insights for people who might not know how what data to access Earth observation data um, and how to get started with analyzing Earth observation data? <clears throat> Okay, thank you for the question. Um, I would like to say, if we are surveyors, perhaps uh, some of the guys may be in school, uh, which means they may be learning some of these things. They may have some, uh, a bit of some knowledge about um, how we can access data. And for those who are in the industry, um, I would just encourage uh, everyone to just go the, the, the sites, try to get the information and then just um, uh, try to use the available tools that we have to process the data. Um, I believe over time, if anyone uh, uses that, uh, okay, practice makes perfect at the end of the day. If we just um, commit ourselves to learning uh, the, the geospatial tools that we have uh, and also the skills, uh, just Working towards um, the assessment of uh, images, um, uh, climate change, and uh, all the issues that may that that may uh, require us to use the tools. For example, some of the sources, as I said earlier, they are free, so anyone can get information from them. So I think uh, that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rindisai. We have um, a question that's coming through from um, Edmund and then after Edmund Cromwell, I thoroughly encourage anyone who has a question to um, to raise your hand. Um, after Cromwell's question, we have another one from Sebastian in the Q&A, which we'll get to. Over to you, Edmund. Well, so, uh, Yes, uh, thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, everybody can you? You're a little bit choppy, Edmund. You see a about the difference between the technology uh, for the developing people. Hello. Hello, everyone. That's Can you hear much me? Better, Edmund. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, thank you very much for these uh, presentations. Uh, my question is about uh, we see uh, the difference between uh, climate technology uh, in the developing uh, country and the developed country. So, uh, is their program? Uh, for the developing country uh, to resolve this uh, technology let uh, I'd like to have uh, much more explanation about uh, my question. Thank you very much. That's a great question, Edmund. I think uh, to summarize what I heard is that there are certain challenges that exist in the global south um, compared to the global north when it comes to um, technology and um, how we can approach solving climate challenges using technology. Um, I'll open up to any of our speakers or indeed anyone in our audience who might like to answer that question. Simon, I can see you have your hand up. And I think you might have some very interesting things to say about mapping the plastics. Uh, yes, um, <laughs> I, I, I think that's that's right. Um, I have a, also a question for um, Rambidzai, but I will come back to that in a minute. But but in terms, yeah, I, I think the technology. Um, one of the challenges I think um, is to harness the technology so that it can be used in uh, in any any uh, country, uh, particularly um, the global south or the third world or small island development states where 
there are budget constraints, um, there are problems, uh, almost overwhelming problems, but also there is a lack of uh, lack of resources to deal with them. So I think I think the key, and particularly in the area that uh, that we work in, which is um, we are working in, which is mapping uh, mapping plastic um, plastic pollution and trying to stop plastic waste being dumped into waterways before it gets into the oceans is 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 using is is using UAV um, orthophotos and, and and relatively cheap technology but but fairly but accurate and, and and algorithm and algorithms that can then sort of map this you know map map the plastic um, and classify the plastic in, in near real time. So I, I think th there's a lot of these areas um, in climate change um, and 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 you know plastic pollution is one 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 part of, of, of climate change where and, and monitoring um, sea level or, or monitoring habitation loss can be done with things like UAV with remote sensing um, with with uh, other surveying um, type applications uh, so that they, that it can come back to the regulators and the policy makers and the decision makers or the resource or, or the response um, you know the response managers uh, in terms of fire or flood or, or or natural disasters that that can come back very quickly. So I, th I think one of the challenges for surveyors and one of the one of one of the opportunities for surveyors is to harness the the very um, the very accurate and 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 becoming more uh, less and less low cost uh, low cost um, tools that that we can then use to. Uh, to inform decision makers and policy makers and 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 others uh, of what needs to be done. So I think that's that's how I would answer that question. And and my question for uh, Ms. Rambidzai, um, thank you very much for your presentation. It was it was fantastic. I took it from what you were saying that um, the government officials and and the people who were responding to the floods. We're listening to you and listening to the the, um, the the remote sensing specialists and the surveying profession and 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 the engineers to um, to help them address the problems and and so do you see that as a positive step forward in terms of the interaction between your profession and 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 government? Yes, I do. That's good. Thank you. Um, that was a great question, Simon. Uh, was there anything you'd like to add to that, Rumbitsai? Ah, uh, there's nothing really. I think it's a bit of self-explanatory. Yeah. No, yeah. no Thank you. Um, I'll now move to a question from Cromwell that we have in the chat. And following Cromwell's question, we'll move to the question um, from Chukwuma. Cromwell, um, over to you. Hi, hello. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever we are in the world right now. Well, my question is simple, really simple. What role should education and training institutions play in building the capacity of surveyors, let's say, from the academia, how they should train or um, help young surveyors and move in their move with their career as they move towards real world problems like climate crisis and management, disaster management. That is a great question, Cromwell. I'd like to invite any of our panelists to just unmute and speak, um, or anyone in the chat who would like to respond to that question, please feel free to yeah. raise your hand. Around. Yeah. Over to you. Yeah, being an academic in the university has a really good question, and it's, uh, so that's what we, as uh, the lecturers or the, the academics, that what we have to do actually. So we have to, you know, as surveys from conventional surveying programs, now we have to shift it towards kind of a interdisciplinary approach in the in the problem solving as well as the curriculum also itself should be revised to a certain extent that to you know incorporate these uh, new areas especially the environmental concern topics to be taught to the students 
so that not only the technical know-how but as well as the the sense of you know environment the feel of environment and the responsibility will come as well as how we are going to approach the environmental related issues with our knowledge has to be stimulated during their program itself so that they are competent in addressing such issues so yeah my answer is yes one thing we can do and we already do in, in our country as well so there are some mandatory components in the curriculum especially related to the environment side so it can be basic through the maybe to the environment impact assessment or to climate concern so that's a new policy in sri lanka that the government want to start a separate university as well so beside that in the, beside the curriculum you know enrichment with the climate sensitive issues as well as the the, the way of teaching so teaching and learning has to be you know refined in a way that more you know rather than having the traditional straightforward you know survey related problem but we have to give the student the opportunity to work on some kind of interdisciplinary approaches so that we can have i mean kind of a panel so expert from different areas and they can work with them and come up with solutions so that type of approach will really enhance the capacity of the students especially the the way of thinking and how they look at the problem will be you know will be changed as well as the for the expert who are already in practice the universities or the academia can support them by having kind of a, a training programs or kind of a continued professional development programs so that we can make them aware of the issues related and we can you know uh, empower them with this knowledge so that is my short answer so yeah, anybody can contribute, yeah, it's over to the others to contribute the essay. Absolutely. Would anyone like to add to that? Thank you for your really well considered response there, Aranda. And as you say, working to support a more multidisciplinary um, approach will help prepare our students now for the challenges that will be more complex in the future to really take the profession forward. I'd now like to um, invite Sebastian Bozio, um, if you're able to speak, to ask your question that you put into the Q&A box, please. We might just come back to Sebastian. Oh, no, Hello. Sebastian, yes. Yeah, can you hear me? We can, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to ask questions. I think earlier, Dr. Paul says something that even in solving in your presentation, moving from uh, going into the chaotic situation, availability of the required data helps in solving problems easily if we can have the uh, data and Dr. Paul mentioned that, that if we can have access to data and then process that data quickly, we should be able to resolve some of the climate challenges. So I'm um, asking whether we'd have uh, portals where we can have access to data to be able to process them quickly and make an informed decision in climate uh, uh, situations. And then uh, secondly, just to support the last question about uh, training and education, most especially advancing in technology from different gaps, uh, especially when you look at the uh, underdeveloped nation, technology becomes uh, very difficult and education embracing up the two gaps and be able to get even if the data is available, how do you assess them? What are the technologies you will use to be able to process this data or even download this data? We have even internet challenges in different countries and stuff. So we're looking at, do we have that portal? If we have that portal, how possible is it for us to have an infrastructure, I mean, globally, to be able to assess this data and equally process this data to be able to make informed decisions? That's my question. 
Um, you know, Sebastian, Thank you. it's such a great question. It has so many threads that are relevant to everything we've talked about today. As, as Paul mentioned in his presentation, when we create a system, often it can be very expensive. And then there are costs related to maintaining it over time. How do we keep it functional and not just uh, relevant to a moment in time? Um, and linking in with how do we build capacity for uh, young surveyors and the surveyors of the future to be able and solve problems rapidly using um, digital means uh, without creating a, a burden that's going to further cre uh, increase the divide between the global north and the global south. Um, I'd like to invite Paul, would you, would you like to comment um, on the great question that Sebastian has put forward? Yes, thank you. Um... Yeah, I was thinking of, of this rapid data processing about this uh, rapid responses after uh, uh, crisis, the crisis situation. And I know uh, research institutions are working on that, but I don't think the tools they develop are commonly available. So that would be one point to improve on. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure if you are aware of the, the these um, uh, map uh, where just volunteers map uh, um, uh, areas after a crisis but of course that also takes long and you depend on volunteers and i think there are techniques already available with uh, automatic object recognition and uh, things like that to, to 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 speed it up so i think uh, yeah uh, it would be nice to to uh, make these uh, techniques more available and as um what was this andreas the name of the sebastian man sebastian sorry Sebastian uh, said in the Global South, the problems with internet connections. Of course, that's also um, yeah, uh, uh, a hindrance. But yeah, I, th I think we also should look at it because it's a whole chain of, uh, of tools and, and systems. We, we, we need to have the overview of the whole chain. And also for surveyors, we need to have that full overview. We depend on others as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I, I, I guess um, I'd also like to ask Wimbitsai or Angela or David from um, the core team, if you're online, would you have any comments about the um, aspect of Sebastian's question that related to the Global North and the Global South? Uh, I'll give the floor to Angela and David. <laughs> okay. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening. Um, I hope you can hear me. We can. Hello. We're a little faint, but we can hear you. Oh, oh okay then. Okay. Thank you. So yes, um, listening to all of the deliberations and um, when we want to speak from the aspect of um, the region where we represent, most especially um, Africa, and um, also uh, looking at the different um, um, policies, I, I, I had David, I think we might have lost you for a second. When um, we're sharing wow. about processes that have been put in place to ensure that the, okay. as, as a young surveyor, one of the things, oh, wow, I think my internet is... Um, <laughs> Okay, um, we just got you back. Would you mind please repeating your answer? Yeah. Maybe I just come back and then um, try to restore the internet connection. Okay, not a problem. Um, while we're waiting for David to um, come back, um, I will open up. We have a question um, that we've been waiting on from 
Chukuma. Um, Chukuma, would you like to um, unmute yourself and share your question? Thank you. Yeah. Yes, we could hear you. Yes. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, uh, good day, everyone. Uh, it's been an interesting. Um, um, it's been an, it's been a, a nice session, and thank you to all the speakers. So my question has to do with um, so we we regard to the global north and south um the disparity in um, in uh, technical capacity um data availability and um you know all the other issues. I think the main issue um. I don't think data availability is the main problem um, because there's a, there's a plethora of um, remote sensing uh, data sets out there that um, what we can take advantage of. Um, yes, we know that uh, um, in-situ data, you know, you need for climate change monitoring, like tight gauges, you know, are very sparse, you know, and some other um, data sets are sparse. But I think um, the, the main issue has to do with um, uh, um, technical uh, capacity to uh, take advantage of uh, so many freely available um, remote sensing data sets out there. And that there's been some initiatives to, um, to produce um, analysis-ready data sets, which try to reduce uh, some of the processing workflows involved in using some of these um, data sets and make them um, ready to use or or make them um um you know um uh, eat, um um uh, much more um uh simpler to uh, to adopt so i think um the technical expertise is where um uh the surveying community and fig can uh, put a lot more um focus that leads me to my next uh, question slash comment um when i look at the uh um, about 10 technical commissions we have in the FIG. Um, I'm wondering how um, how well positioned, you know, um, is the FIG and surveyors to um, uh, contribute to real world uh, problems, you know, such as contemporary issues such as climate change. You know, for example, you know, if you look at um, um, some of the um, uh, fundamental or foundational um, expertise, you know, you require to uh, make uh, 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 substantial contributions, you know, in uh, some of these issues. You know, you look at the computer vision, um, artificial intelligence. Um, you look at cloud computing, and a lot of um, you know, if you you you, you look at um, you know, working with big data and um, it, and just uh, it's it's a it's a lot. And then when I look at the you know, if you do an overview of the working groups within the FIG commissions, I know there's a commission, I think, for special information management, which is probably the closest that comes to, uh, you know, um, having uh, a focus on on remote sensing, GIS, computer vision, uh, uh, you know, and things like that. I, I think I, I, I think there's a very, I, I think the focus is a bit, I don't know, I, 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 I think the focus is not is a bit um narrow. Like I think there's a narrow, very narrow focus, you know. So most of the FIG technical commissions are strong on cadastral engineering, surveying, positioning. But um, when you look at some of these um, other subject areas, you know, where uh, that are very fundamental to uh, uh, you know climate change, you know, and um, some of some other contemporary issues. So, so, so my 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 question there is, um, how is is the FIG itself by it um by it uh, by the way its technical commissions are structured because the technical commissions definitely drive um the research agenda you know of a of a society like the FIG, you know, and the the research agenda is what could promote multidisciplinary collaboration and even um uh, making high impact on novel contributions to the body of knowledge. So, so I want to I want to know, and I want to ask, you know, the FIG itself, you know, um, by its uh, by the way its technical commission and its research agenda is structured, you know, is it is it well positioned to encourage or engender 
um, um, uh, novelty, you know, among surveyors with regard to uh, uh, making impactful uh, uh, contributions to the body of knowledge, you know, or to the current uh, uh, discourse on climate change. Thank you. That is an excellent question, Chukuma. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly there, but I'm really glad that you brought that up because as you say that there, there is a historically within our industry, we've had a strong focus on cadastral um, <clears throat> and some of the, the very traditional surveying techniques that are focused around land. We are, we are definitely finding that as we move towards um, the broadening and the um, evolution of the role of our industry moving forward, that while the, the 10 technical commissions definitely um, cover many areas, we are seeing a, a real evolution of the shape of our industry. Um, I do, um, I, I guess I might jump in with my personal view here, and then I'll open the floor up to anybody else who would like to speak. Um, before we return back to David's comment before, which related to young surveyors, which is very interesting. Um, uh, Clarissa and I, um, as part of the um, ACO, the, the um, group within FIG who supports the um, selection of the papers uh, for the working week that's coming up in Ghana, we uh, were absolutely astounded by the amount of climate related papers that came through in abstracts submitted this year for um, Ghana in uh, May. Um, there were, was it 76, Clarissa? I might ask if you wanted to jump in here. Yeah, yes, about 76 and, and across all commissions. And, and so it was really encourage, encouraging for us to see that, um, you know, compared to previous years, and even in Orlando last year, there was actually a really strong presence of climate related papers across commissions, not just for um, a particular task force, um, which I think, um, in my mind, demonstrates that there is recognition of um, new technologies, new analytics approaches, things like AI and machine learning, cloud computing, the way that we use these technologies um, to help us in our work and how we operate as surveyors to solve problems. Um, I, I think it is emerging across each of the different commissions. And the role of this task force is also supporting um, sort of pulling up of climate related um, analytics tools and you know modeling tools etc through all of the commissions um, I might uh, quickly pass to Aranda who is um, the yeah. chair of commission four yeah thank you and it's again uh, yeah it's quite uh, you know insightful question yeah if I do you know you have to first you have to realize that this is a kind of a more like a voluntary you know association so and so that is one thing and the other thing is you know the the fig policy is every four years term we appoint uh, or elected the new commission chairs and the members for the uh, commissions and the networks and all that so in that context it's somewhat you know kind of a conservation conservative uh, method but the important thing here is that as you look at through their working work plan, so every four years time they propose new work plans. So some they will bring forward the existing work plans, it may be still valid, but new elements are coming in. So as you carefully go through each and every commission's work plan, there, there are some elements related to the current issues. So as again, it's since it's a kind of a voluntary based uh, structure, so we can't push anybody, so it's the people who are involved work together and they come up with some plans and the FIG Commission, the FIG Commission Council will approve it and it, 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 it endorses it and it continues like that. So if you look at, in my, especially in my commission, we, I mean, we already established a new working group, 4.5, especially working on this uh, climate induced sea level rise. And Australian teams are, you know, leading that uh, working group. So most of the things that we discussed today is under there. So 
and apart from that the the, the, the working group 4.2 the sustainable oceans and hydrography led by the Simon the, sorry the Gordon Johnston so is he also recently you know, you know mentioning something about carbon footprinting of the hydrography so it's again even though the name or the title it does not follow it but inside the mechanism is working for it like again the mapping the plastics so it's again something related with the not the climate change but it has some indirect issues so but it's the uh, anthropogenic you know issue that was created to the environment so so if you look in detail not just the name of the commission so the details are there so and on top of that so this time we uh, with the uh, new uh, you know round we have this uh, climate task force was implemented so with the Diane special, uh, you know, the president special concern. So, so, the, so there's another, you know, structure with the uh, FIG is. So since we are, you know, fixed with the commissions and all that. In addition to that, we have the networks, like young surveyors and some other, you know, networks. You know, they work for an extensively long period of time. And then and there, if the need arises, if the issue is there, the FIG, you know, fig appoint the task forces so only they work for a specific object or specific task so that is why we call it task force so, so that's one so that is what we see the climate task force the climate is called the climate compass so they will work for you know four years maybe or it can be extended and they will report to the fig later on with their findings and all that then at the next stage, so once we have all the information and we have the expert team in the FIG and matured enough, so we can further develop into a maybe a network or maybe a commission, I mean separate uh, uh, commission. So, so that's the structure actually. So so if we just, I mean, just also say the summarizing, the FIG is working on that. So as despite a lot of challenges that we do also having, you know, being volunteered to commit do all the things financially and the time and all these constraints so yeah, in a way we are you know working on that and just uh, just go through thoroughly with the details and of course you try to you know work with at least or maybe commissions or task force be associated with them get to know them and you know you associate with them and you will know that what is really these teams are doing and also we are encouraged everyone to join because again it's a voluntary thing so you can join as a national uh, delegate or even a student you can you know raise your voice you can give your input so we are always willing to welcome those inputs and insight and we'll you know you know we consider them so that's my you know explanation for that but yeah no th thank you very much aranda i think um that covers a, a, a broad range of context around how commissions are bringing forward um, climate-related technologies, methods, topics, themes into the structure of their work plans, their working groups to be able to work within, um, I guess, the structure of the 10 commissions to, to bring forward these issues slowly over time. Um, I'll pass to Cromwell here, who would like to speak about Commission 3 that he's heavily involved in. Right, thank you, Roshni. And um, I'd like to address because um, I just got back from the annual meeting of Commission 3 and Commission 9 in Malta two weeks ago. And that um, event, we were able to um, shape our focus exactly on climate-related issues like disaster management, mitigation, proper spatial planning with the use of spatial data infrastructures. I think on um, my personal opinion on this, that while Commission 3 is heavily focused on the technical and technological part of, uh, of our profession with the use of these latest kinds of technology, um, the the recent um, um events natural events that we encountered from 2020 onwards uh really um hit some interesting idea it it picked our idea our interest in focusing on such um sensitive issues so uh, we have some um working groups within commission 3 and commission 9 who are working on together with a special planning and we have another working group i think 
um, in close collaboration with uh, young surveyors to, you know, have um, continuity interoperability within commissions and uh, within FIG networks and, and task forces. Uh, yeah, so we will see, I think, um, like um, Roshan was saying, uh, there are lots of um, abstracts presented on which are climate related. I think um, some of my personal in my um, from our from our team would be presenting in those uh, sessions. So we'll see how uh, in Accra with the next um, commission meetings how we we will evolve and you know adapt like we need to do in climate related tasks adapt our work plans moving along. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cromwell. Um... I'll see if we can head back to David now. David, are you able to speak? Uh, hey, okay. Um, can you hear me now? We can. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I was mentioning um the other time about um, um some of the things, most especially like um when we talk about um uh, the involvement of the young ones to the issues that has to do with the the global north, the global south. And I, I see um, Dr. Chukuma had already talked about um, um, the capacity building, which I uh, Roshni will agree with me that it's one of the focus because um, from from the uh, from the region where I come from in Nigeria, you know, uh, we do more of technicality, and um, as surveyors, yes, we could be technical, which is good, but again, we must understand um, the social cultural and all the backgrounds that affect some of these policies that have been made and also to understand um, how the government plays a um, major role so that as professionals, we could um, come up or advise better. Um, events like this actually encourages to um, have a better understanding on how things are done. And um, also expecting that um, others are able to learn from the different things that um, have been contributed, like solutions, like uh, I've listened to Dr. Paul talked about um, what they do in Dutch. I've read about it, I've heard about it many times and um, addressing flaws, addressing issues that will come with um, climate change. But um, again, we, we listen, but um, sometimes we don't have the ability to be able to um, push this further in our various countries to have a voice to say, oh, um, can we incorporate some of these ideas and see how it works for us? So um, I, I think the education is very, very important. Uh, it's very important for us to um, even as a young one to be part of events like this and also contribute and listen to learn to build more capacity and add more to knowledge then um, yes data could be part of it but I think the data the availability of um, tools to be used also access to tools to be used can be very very um, discouraging uh, a lot of persons do a lot of course research on things like what we had discussed today but with limitation to access to tools that can be used. And um, I, I think in all of the presentations I've listened to um, our speaker from Zimbabwe, and the only thing she could talk about to be open source is um, the QGIS. Every other thing, you just have to find the means to um, to find the way to, to use um, other methods or the costs, it's cost um, expensive for you to be able to come up with the uh, the research. But again, after the research, um, what do we use them for? These are some things that we need to begin to look into. So you take a course, you do a research on them, then what exactly um, do we use this um, research for in terms of implementation um, at the different um, countries or environments where we find ourselves? Then quickly, let me jump to the question that um, um, Dr. Chukuma has asked about um, the involvement and the um, Yes, the FIG actually is um, streamlined into um, commissions, but not just commissions now. We now have network. Uh, uh, I, I think this um, the climate compass is just about a year now, and um, the truth is it never existed before, but it's something that was seen to be very, very needful and um, that needs to come up. And it came up, and it's coming up with um, discussions like this. And we have other networks that I think are, are working. But uh, I've also learned that in all of the commissions, there are now sub commissions where you know you you get to integrate some of the um, other aspects of surveying that are not majorly cadastral or land matters, but uh, um, uh, areas where surveyors actually play 
um, massive role. Like the SDG task force is actually very wide itself. And um, many of us are also involved in trying to do one thing or the other that can uh, bring about the relevance of the of the profession. And um, as young surveyors, we're looking at the future also and seeing how we could make it a, a better place and conducive for every one of us. So I'll just stop here. Thank you very much, Roshni. Thank you, David. That was a lot of broad, um, really useful comments covering a lot of relevant points. Um, we have a question in the chat from Norman, sorry, in the Q&A. Um, Norman, are you in a position to unmute and ask us your question? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, my question is uh, with regards to how it is possible to deal with uh, government agencies and the municipalities in resolving the pollution levels. For example, if you've used GIS for remote sensing to detect those uh, pollution levels, how can one go about it? That's a really, really um, important question, given that pollution is one of the um, most significant drivers to um, creating the climate, climate crisis um, alongside biodiversity loss. Um, I'll open up the floor to any of our speakers who might want to um, answer answer that, but I might um, start with Aranda, who I know um, has led and um, been involved in a lot of work around um, monitoring and managing um, and detecting pollution. Yep, I didn't get the full question correct, so can you repeat it again? Well, I just heard the last part, sorry about that. So can you repeat it in a briefly, so that I can give a better input? Okay, so my question is, uh, let's say, for example, you're working with government or agencies or organizations, municipalities, for example, uh, then you uh, may be a GIS specialist or a surveyor, then you use your softwares or your expertise to detect a pollution, uh, then how best do you now uh, convey that data set to the municipalities or agencies to make sure that or ensure that they reduce the pollution levels? For example, I can also share, say, for example, let's say the research that was done by Ms. Rumbizai, I think she did uh, see that there was um, uh, some effects that were caused by the cyclone in that part of the country. But uh, how do then they use that information to help the community, for example, the government, how do they uh, then try to mitigate the destruction that has been done or something like that? Yeah, so the one thing that we have to clear is like if you are working in a particular firm or agency, so we have our mandate and we have our norms. And besides that, I'm, yeah, it's, it's a serious concern that we have to, you know, if you look at any, you know, any environment or any concern things happen, yeah, as, as a citizen or person that we have to be watchful, vigilant about what is happening. And the first thing that we have to do is, you know, my general advice is we have to report to a, you know, respective authority. So I mean, we are not the first people to, you know, go and, you know, investigate that to, or just to, you know, go and, you know, inquire about it. Because we are survey, so it's our duty is to, you know, you know, it's something else. So if, if it is, I and mean, if you are given the, you know, authority, then it, yeah, it's up to you to go and investigate whether it's an oil spill or whatever, you know something you dump into some area and you want to investigate that how much extent or how much volume or what will be the consequence so that's up to you but it's kind of like you know I mean beyond going from that level to you know kind of a direct involvement is yeah as a citizen the best thing is you can, you can go and report to the respective authorities it may be the uh, whoever I mean the respective person or the, the engineer whoever is responsible for that agency so my advice is that so other than just you as a survey you go there and you know 
in the way, I am not recommending that it will create some other unnecessary problems. So that's my professional advice. I mean, yeah, but it's always useful that you are vigilant about the environment. And if you see, say that you go to survey a particular land and you have noticed that the next neighboring land, there was some, you know, some other serious environmental pollutant thing is happening. So just, uh, you know, take some photos or just, uh, you know, you don't go there because sometimes it will be a problem for your life as well. So you just better report it accordingly to the respective authority. So that's the best thing you can do. So they will, they have the authority and they will act on behalf of the society or the people because they have the powers and they are covered with the mandate. So that's the important thing. Thank you very much, Hiranda. We'll now move to our last question um, from Mika. Uh, Mika, are you in a position to unmute and ask us your question? Yes, uh, I wrote it quite long. Uh, thank you. Uh, very, very interesting presentations and very interesting topic that uh, in, in the end it came to my mind that uh, how, how this is for all in a way. Uh, how do you see the role of surveyors in development of future digital modeling standards for cities and environment and their connection to the climate change topic? Because uh, to my experience, these standards are now being developed and, and they've been developing in total, totally new topics, which traditionally have not been something surveyors do. We are not experts of digital city models, for example. So how do you see what kind of role the surveys could take in the future in, in this. And uh, as, as the development happens in ISO, send building smart and open geospatial consortium, uh, should there be more, more activities from surveyors? And you know, that is a great question, Mika. Um, the role of surveyors is shifting and evolving as we deal with more complex issues and around climate and we're moving to using more digital tools as well. Um, I'd like to ask Paul if he might be willing to comment on that. Yes, it's, it's a very uh, good question. Um, yeah, it's always the, the you can ask yourself uh, things are being developed by other domains and then sometimes you think we should have been involved. I think we, we are in a world we are connected, so we can get involved. But maybe I, I again I'm a guy who, who asks questions when somebody gives a question to me. The problem we have in the Netherlands is that we don't get uh, students for geospatial sciences. So I think we we are just low in numbers, so we cannot join every uh, nice development. So maybe I can ask the audience, from, like, do you uh, have the same experience that you just have lack of students? Because I think, yeah, we have major problems to solve. There's lots of work to be done, but we don't have the number of people to help us. So maybe somebody can comment on that. It's a, it's a really good point, Paul. Um, I know that Clarissa has done some really interesting thinking and some interesting work on the evolving role of the surveyor. So I might... Um, pass for final comments to Mika's question to Clarissa. Well, thank you very much, uh, Roshni. Um, I, I know we we're coming towards the end of our se a seminar now. We just have a, two more pres quick presentations and then we're going to wrap up. <clears throat> but uh, I, I think that the first thing we need to say is we have to expand the number of surveyors and the, and the capacity and the number of roles in order to achieve our climate goals. So one of the things um, we're trying to do here is to say, look, guys, there are these national plans that are already in place that your government has committed to. And uh, you, there's lots of money associated with the climate agenda. It's, you know, often surveyors suffer from a lack of money. And in government, the, the budget is too small um, and that's also why surveyors are not attracted into the private sector and into, into those kind of jobs. So um, what we're saying is, you know, it's about reaching out to partners, but it's also about learning a new language. And what we're hearing from Miranda, for instance, is we've got to be multidisciplinary. 
Um, and then making that step, trying to hook into what your government plan is, which, you know, which is what we around pre presented and see uh, and, and influence others to come with you on that journey. Um, and it is a journey and we all have to do it. Everybody's got grandchildren. You have to do it. <laughs> That's the future. And, and the second thing, you know, as I'm saying, is not only is, is climate finance, but education needs to be about problem solving. It's not just about content transfer anymore. We have big problems. We have to solve them pro properly and quickly. So, um, guys, you, we've presented some fantastic problem solving approaches and you've shared with each other. And, and we really want to thank you for that. Thank you, Roshni. Thank you very much, Clarissa. I'll now pass to Dana Heyman, our fabulous live scriber and graphic recorder, to share with us the full um, version of the graphic um, recording that she's been doing. Hi guys, how you doing? Um, just making sure my screen's coming through. Alrighty, so just give it a moment to switch over. Come on. There we go. Um, it's been a very uh, great evening to track for you guys today. Um, it has been a very interesting challenge to get across the um, complex language that you as an industry use. Um, but I'm pretty pleased with how this is shaping up at this stage. We'll zoom into the bottom down here, um, which takes us to where um, Roshni presented the Carnifin uh, Leading in Complexity model, where she explored and shared with us the thinking around um, how we approach problems in different uh, kind of spaces, whether that be clear, um, very simple uh, working sort of processes into more complicated, complex and chaotic spaces. Um, during this presentation, we kind of learned that um, the surveying industry uh, is moving much more into this complex and chaotic uh, way of um, practice, whether it's emergent, novel and rapid responses to problems that are big and scaled and um, interconnected. Um, and then that really sort of um, led us into some really great discussion around what does this really mean for surveyors? Um, you know, Roshni calling out that um, you guys are very skilled in the detail and the certainty, um, but we must be get better in that uncertain spaces to support others. Um, because to solve climate change, we need to work, um, we are stronger and we need to work together. Zooming in a little bit more, we did do um, some great conversation in the bottom corner here. I've only managed to capture a few of points of this great, um, this great discussion, but some of the highlights that came out there were really calling out the, um, the acknowledgement of the Global South um, capability divide, whether that be access to technology, um, you know, skills in that space and things like that. Um, and then on the other side, in the Global North, they've got a, a a technical challenge around um, the amount of data and the speed needed to process that. Um, so very interesting um, polar opposite challenges that needed to be called out and spoken about at this level. Um, and then, you know, we moved into talking about role of roles of education. Um, uh, that's my drawing of an apple and a mango there. Um, and, you know, sort of what that kind of means for education. And lastly, the future, really expanding into that future casting of how are we going to bring this all together eventually one day, possibly. Um, as I said, it's been a great session to record. Um, I will continue to polish this up and finalise this, and I will be along to the other seminars as well. So keep an eye out for the full set of artworks when they come out. Thank you, Roshni. Back to you. Thank you so much, Dana. And I have to say, seeing, um, seeing you work is always a pleasure. The way that you synthesise ideas and display the connections between different pieces of the puzzle, um, it really helps to convert um, data into information, into knowledge, into wisdom. So thank you. We look forward very much to seeing the finished products. I will um, share my screen now and walk through some of the, uh, oops. I'll, uh, I'll hand back to Clarissa to walk through some of the final notes before we move to the first 
um, annual task force meeting and we thoroughly encourage any of you who are able to stay online for the next half an hour to join us for this. It'll be on this exact same link. You don't need to move anywhere, um, but it will be a furthering of the opportunity for us all to meet each other, to network and to really come together and build community, which is what this task force is ultimately about. Over to you, Clarissa. Thank you. Thank you, Roshni. Uh, we hope you enjoyed yourself today. Uh, we'll be running another set of seminars uh, next year. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we are, will be running webinars, which will be one and a half hours, again, three speakers, times for discussion. Um, and there will be um, two or three webinars this year. So we will keep you posted. Please uh, uh, participate. And we would really invite you to join the Climate Compass Task Force LinkedIn page. Um, I'm wondering if somebody could put that into the chat. Uh, we, 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 we try and do some blogs. We try and just share with each other what's happening in the world that makes sense to us um, and to build our own knowledge and capacity and um, our own contribution to achieving uh, the, uh, the climate goals of the planet. And then uh, finally, uh, just to, so not finally, we have this big meeting coming up in May, uh, this FIG, uh, FIG Working Week in Ghana, and uh, FIG Climate Campus Task Force will have a number of sessions. We'll have a, a joint session with the Young Surveyors, a joint session with the Hydrographic Surveyors Commission 4, a joint session with Commission 7, uh, which is on the Cadastre and Land Administration, and we will also have our own climate session, a uh, session of papers, followed by an interactive conversation with the audience. Um, and there's a question mark still about posters. Um, and we will also have a workshop where uh, the committee members that you saw here will be part, form part of a panel and describe th what they heard from these seminars. So these seminars, plus the live scribe from Dana, will become the central piece of a workshop to people in participants in Ghana to start thinking again and, and taking it even further than we have here. So thank you very much for enriching this path. And just to let, let you know, the recording will be available on the FIG Climate Compass Task Force YouTube channel, along with our other meetings. And uh, please stay with us now as we move into immediately into the FIG Compass, Climate Compass Task Force meeting, which is next. And thank you for being with us. We really appreciate you.